Good morning. Uh, thank you all. Um, I'd like to call the Transportation and Commerce Committee to order. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderwoman Tyus. Alderwoman Spencer. Present. Alderman Narayan. Here. Alderwoman Velasquez. Present. Alderman Browning. Present. Chair Cohn. Present. Alderwoman Tyus. We have five present. We have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, the first order of business would be the approval of the minutes from Monday, September 8th, commi our committee meeting. And I'll take a motion to approve the minutes from September 8th, 18th, excuse me. So moved. Second. Madam Clerk, would you uh, point, point of order, though, Madam Vice Chair. Sure. I. Uh, Alderwoman Tyus uh, was removed from the committee, so she should not be part of a role. Okay, I don't have notification of that, and she's on our agenda listed as a committee member, um, Mr. Chair. She's no longer a member of the committee, so it doesn't, she was removed last week. Okay. Noted. We will proceed. Okay, so um, today we're going to be hearing um, Board Bills 33 and Board Bills 34. Um, I well, we do, I'm sorry, but we we didn't. Oh, excuse me, you're right. I didn't take a roll on the um, on, on the on the meeting minutes. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, if you could take take a roll call on that, I'd appreciate it. Okay. So, um, Chair Spencer. Aye. Or Vice Chair Spencer. Alderman Narayan. I. Alderwoman Velasquez. I. Alderman Browning. I. Chair Cohn. I. We have five I votes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, okay, today we will be discussing one of the most pressing issues facing our city, uh, short-term rentals. While this may not seem like a super pressing issue to some, um, certainly I think that we can all acknowledge that Airbnbs and short-term rentals have run amok in our city. We were one of the last cities in the nation to take on regulation. Um, so we have a lot to learn from other cities um, and it's important that we get this done. Um, I wanna take this opportunity um, as the vice chair of this committee overseeing this uh, topic to uh, kind of just describe where we've been and to clear up some really unfortunate misinformation. Um, while I'm overseeing this topic, um, I have been and continue to be ready, willing and eager to have hearings on this bill. Um, and we will be holding hearings uh, in this committee on a weekly regular basis until we get this done. Now, as far as today's concern, we do have a committee sub I'd like to um, put before us. I know we did get the list of changes on Friday of last week. Um, and I believe the committee sub was prepared yesterday or at least sent around. Um, I know the public has not seen that, but I, I think putting it before us and discussing the changes that were made uh, should move us in the right direction. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to the sponsor, Alderman Narayan, for an introduction of that, of the changes made um, over the summer. Thank you, Chairwoman Spencer, or Vice Chair Spencer. Um, we uh, have before us board bill in 33 and 34, which are companion bills to regulate short-term rentals. Uh, these bills have in some form or another been before this board for several years now. Uh, we had two uh, committee hearings this session, uh, one Zoom, one at City Hall. Both were very well attended. We, we had a lot of feedback from them. Uh, what we did is we took that feedback and made almost 40 changes in a committee substitute as a result of that feedback after discussion with the building division, uh, the legal department, the police department, uh, you know, vir virtually every stakeholder around um, to figure out where we could get to in terms of enforcement of these uh, regulations. Uh, what we didn't wanna do was saddle the uh, building division with, uh, with 
things that we knew that they weren't going to be able to enforce, same with the police department. Uh, we also needed to be mindful of the uh, potential of litigation on this. We've seen in many other, uh, we, we do have the, the advantage as uh, Alderman Spencer uh, pointed out of being a bit of a late mover here in terms of regulations. So we have been able to see in other jurisdictions, uh, things that have failed, things that have worked and things that have drawn lengthy litigation. And uh, what we're trying to do with, with these bills is also to avoid litigation. Uh, we know that the platforms are quite willing to litigate these matters. We saw it in New York, where uh, the litigation held up basically three years. Uh, 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 the regulations were held up for, for almost three years uh, while a stay order was in place. So there were no regulations of short-term rentals during that time. We want to avoid something like that. Uh, my belief is that we need to get regulations onto the books as soon as possible. And then we can tinker with those regulations as we move forward, because we know that there's gonna be uh, somewhat of a, uh, uh, an uploading period for the uh, building division to, to uh, be able to act actually get everything in place in order to, uh, to enforce these regulations. Um, so with that, uh, I would move that we adopt, uh, well, I guess, uh, Chairwoman, would you like, uh, like me to adopt Board Bill 33 and, and then do that and then 34, or uh, can we do it in one motion? No, I, I'm going to handle these separately. And what I wanted like to do, Alderman Ryan, is consider, I think we need to put the committee set before us for discussion. Um, but, you know, I, so if you want, if you'd like to move to put before us Board Bill 33 as committee substitute as was distributed to the committee yesterday. I would yeah, so uh, I, I'll move that uh, we put Board Bill Committee Sub 30 or 33 Committee Sub uh, in front of the committee that uh, was sent to everyone uh, over the weekend. Um, and uh, so it's been in your mailboxes. And then I believe that the clerk uh, distributed it. Uh, Monday morning, uh, which is the, there's the 24 hour uh, period there, but I distributed it uh, prior to that um, to several of, of uh, the folks on this who had asked for it. Um, so yeah, I, I would move that we put board bill 33 committee sub in front of the committee. A second that motion. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderwoman, I'm sorry. I'm going to go in order, Senor. So I'm just going to say, um, Vice Chair Spencer? Aye. Alderman Ryan? Aye. Alderman Velasquez? Aye. Alderman Browning? Aye. Chair Cohn? We have four aye votes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. For the record, I believe Alderman Cohn is recusing himself from this topic. Um, okay. Alderman uh, Narayan, if you could please, we, what I'd like to do is discuss the changes that were made um, from our last committee hearing, which I believe was July 11th, which seems like eons ago, uh, to today on the committee on the bill before us. Sure. Uh, so, so there's roughly uh, there's 30 some odd changes. Um, I can go through them. Uh, and I also have uh, Sarah Baker uh, from the administration on the on the call. I believe that she's a participant rather than a panelist at the moment. Um, but she also would be uh, a, a good resource uh, for the committee on that, um, because she made many of the changes. Um, so for the one of the first things we did is we limited the minimum stay to two nights. That was uh, a, a major uh, issue that we heard in committee was that we wanted uh, to, to avoid the, the, the party houses. Um, and one of the ways that we've seen other jurisdictions be able to do this is by limiting stays to two nights, or excuse me, not limiting stays to two nights, a two night minimum stay. Uh, and that, that gets rid of some of the incentive for uh, for people to rent a short-term rental for one night, have a big party there, 
They're not concerned about the neighbors. They're not concerned about uh, law enforcement. Um, they can just have a, uh, uh, a, a raging party with no concern uh, and there's no consequences at the end. And the operator of the short-term rental uh, in, some, in some instances almost uh, encourages this. Uh, I believe Alderman Volmer told me that there was one in his ward called, I believe, like Jam House or something like that. And it, it, it was being marketed as a place to throw parties. Um, and so we wanted to, uh, wanted to first cut out the incentive to do that. Um, we uh, also gave the building commissioner the power to single-handedly initiate revocation of permits of uh, the short-term rentals. Uh, we uh, added that the owner has to show that personal property tax is paid um, at any uh, short-term rental. Uh, uh, there, there, there's a provision now that uh, three instances uh, of, um, of violations in a 12-month period will um, lead to revocation of the license uh, or of the permit, excuse me. There'll also be a public registry of revoked permits. So uh, the general public will be able to go and look to see if uh, any uh, permit ha has been revoked. And if so, and they still are seeing short-term rental activity there, they can report that to the city. Um, there's also an intake portal, an online portal um, that uh, will address questions and complaints uh, that'll work through the Citizen Service Bureau. Um, we removed a provision that a violation of short-term rental could result in eviction. We heard some concerns from uh, people who owned uh, buildings uh, that, you know, if, if my, uh, if someone is leasing the building and they engage in a short-term rental and all of a sudden there's an eviction, um, that, that becomes a, a real issue for the, the owner of the building. So we changed that to revocation of the permit and then liability for the permit holder. Um, there's clarification in the permit that uh, includes acknowledgement that violations will result in the revocation of the permit. Uh, the building commissioner, we, we added that the building commissioner can start a review and revocation based on even a single violation. So they don't have to wait. The building commissioner does not have to wait for three. It's not like a three strikes and you're out. Uh, even on a first instance of a violation, the building division can start their review and revocation. Uh, however, they are compelled to do it on the third violation. They must on three violations uh, within a year act. Um, so, uh, we, we made it so that on we're combining uh, forces basically with uh, building inspectors and the police department so that they're working together on documenting violations. Uh, previously we had, they were kind of siloed uh, and we had the complaints to the police department uh, in one place, complaints to the building division in another, uh, and this will combine those so that we, we're we working more together as a city on it. The right hand will know what the left hand is doing. Um, we... Uh, there, there was some language in there that was changed uh, uh, that was just some some relics. We had both um, permit and license. Um, so we just clarified that language. Um, there's a, a cap of four uh, short-term rentals that uh, applies to the applicants. Um, so any individual will only be able to get four permitted short-term rentals. Um, there, 
you need to turn. Do you have these changes outlined that you wanted to share publicly in, or that you could go from a list or? Um, yeah, I emailed that list to most of the, uh, to, to the committee, uh, and, uh, I can, uh, I'm not sure how, uh, I could get that to the general public, but, uh, certainly can, can do that. Um, and, uh, I'm just thinking if you're wanting to share that list, uh, recently or today, we could use that as kind of a starting point to go through and kind of talk through some of these changes and some of the things that have been missing from the list as far as questions are concerned. Um, yeah, I, I, I believe that, uh, and my, my feeling on this is that, you know, we, we have had robust community input in this, uh, draft reg uh, this draft this committee sub is the culmination of that community feedback uh and i would like for this to uh to move out of committee today to ensure that by next summer that we have these regulations in place knowing that the building division is going to need time uh to to institute these regulations uh we've seen in in prior sessions uh that this exact piece of, of legislation has really gotten bogged down in committee. Uh, and I think that uh, we need to take these changes, we've instituted these changes, uh, and we need to get it to the floor to debate it with all of our colleagues uh, and make changes on the, uh, the, the, the margins here, um, because we do have, th this draft is the culmination of several years of conversations on this. Uh, and I want to make sure that by uh, next summer when, uh, you know, it's party season again, that the, um, that the building division has all these regulations in place and is ready to enforce them alongside uh, the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department. Um, I, I, I would ask that this committee, uh, hold a vote on this to move this forward. Um, we, we've been discussing this as a board for four years now. Uh, this work started with, uh, to, to my knowledge, at least this work started with Alderman Navarro and then went through Alderman Ingracia. And uh, at the very end of last session, um, the, 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 the votes were there, but the, the draft was not finished in a uh, timely manner for introduction with the uh, the the last date to introduce bills. Um, we took that exact same draft that had the votes with all of our colleagues, and I know that we went from 28 to 14, um, but we took that exact same draft, introduced it uh, here to this committee, had two very well attended uh, community meetings uh, on the issue took the feedback from those meetings and put them into this community, uh, into this committee substitute. Um, and then uh, came here today uh, to, to, and the hope is to move this to uh, the full board. Uh, we know that it's not a complete piece of legislation at the moment uh, and that we will need. It's not um, there in my mind. If it's not a complete piece of legislation and we've been working on it for four years, I find it to be, there's, there's no excuse for that. You know, I agree with you that moving this forward as quickly as possible is, should be a priority for this body and this committee. And I have been nothing short of begging for the committee sub the entire summer since I took over the helm at this, of this topic on July 11th of earlier this year. And we just got it. I think there's still a lot of work to be done. You yourself just said this is not a complete set of, of piece of legislation. And frankly, I find that really disappointing. I understand your desire to move this forward, but we are the last city in the nation to get this done. And you know, said so that we don't have all the pieces ready is 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 really, really disappointing. I have a ton of questions about the changes. I'd like to get into the meat of it, if you don't mind. You mentioned some of the changes, one of which the most important, which you pointed out is the one night minimum. Um, this one night minimum is in the whereas clauses, as far as I can tell in the bill. The whereas clauses are not the substance of the bill. Is there anywhere in the bill 
that will go into law that will be codified as law that states the one night minimum. Uh, Chairwoman Spencer, I would say that this is not a complete piece of legislation because no piece of legislation is complete until it's gone through the perfection process. Uh, we know that. And to answer your question, yes, it is in there. Okay, can you show me where in the bill the one night minimum It's is on page five. Okay, so page five, where the, that is the, what that says. I that that piece, no permit shall be issued for any short term rental which offers a minimum stay of two nights. But that only speaks to the permit process and does not ban one night stays from that. It, that does not ban one night stays. That just simply says that no permit will be issued for those who are specifying that they're going to offer two night minimums. So my request to change would be to put to codify in the law that no one night stays are permitted um, well, and that any uh, issue. Uh, but Vice Chair Spencer, you cannot have a non-permitted short-term rental in the city of St. Louis. So if we do not issue permits for short-term rentals that offer any stays of less than two nights, that, that is already an unlawful short-term rental. Do you feel, uh, the way that I read this, a permit shall not be issued, it, the way it specifically reads, no permit shall be issued for any short-term rental which offers a minimum stay of two of less than two nights. Once the permit is issued, there's nothing prohibiting that owner from, ish, from, from having a one-night stay. What I'm asking for and requesting and pointing out that the bill is lacking a provision requiring that no one-night stays be offered once the permit is issued. And I think that the whereas clause at the beginning, which specifies that should be codified into law to prohibit that. And there should also be provisions to revoke that or have, have, have um, to, you know, to protect the neighbors and the community once the permit is issued on that. Um, the same is true of some of the other, one of the other whereas clauses related to property rights. These are things that need to be codified. There's a couple of other pieces that were identified in several of the community meetings that are not included, one of which is the occupancy permit process. If you, perhaps, I've, perhaps I've missed this in the bill, Alderman and Ryan, and forgive me, I really only have had the committee sub for a couple of days, but the occupancy permit process for um, short-term rentals is not outlined in the bill to my knowledge. Um, can you point me to where that might be? So that, that uh, is, a lot of this is at the discretion of the, uh, the um, building director and uh, Frank Oswald is here and he can speak on that. I'm asking if it's codified in law that, those, that these units have occupancy permits. Yeah, they do have to have occupancy permits and there's inspections. Uh, that's all part of the permitting process. Is that part of the bill? Is that codified? Yes. yes. Can you point to where in the bill that is codified? Uh, Sarah Baker is on the line, uh, and she would be able to, I believe, point you to the uh, exact locations of some of those things. Okay. Madam Clerk, would you mind bringing over Sarah Baker? I think she might be in the participant section of the, of the hearing here. Yeah, I'm looking to see her, and I'm not seeing her name. So she's, let me see, Baker. Uh, her, oh, there she is. is up, yeah. Uh -oh. A point of order. Sure, state your point of order, Alderman Brown. Can we follow the normal questioning order and uh, let Alderman Ryan finish his presentation, and then move through the committee asking questions? And I, I understand there's a lot of I have a lot of questions too, and I just want to make sure everyone has a chance to do it, but that we keep a certain order to this. Uh, I'd like to avoid a back and forth. I don't think it's serving the constituents well when we do that. Uh, so I'd like to bring in some order and then we can bring in the expert witnesses and have them answer questions as we have them. Uh, but I think that there's, there needs to be some sort of order in how we do this. Otherwise, uh, myself and the other committee members will not have a chance to, uh, ask the questions that we have as well. Alderman Browning, I appreciate that. Uh, we do have a set of, uh, order here, the chair of, excuse me, the sponsor, I believe that finished his presentation. I can allow him to continue with the presentation of the changes. I was taking my privilege as the chair of this committee over this topic to ask my questions first, um, but certainly was going to proceed with questions from the 
committee as well. I have a series of them I'd like to have addressed. Um, but certainly, I think you know your your point that all committee members be able to ask questions is salient. Um, Alderman Ryan, if you have more from your presentation um, on the changes of the committee itself, we were delving into the topic of voting instead of the, the meat of the um, of the uh, bill, which is what I'd like to stick to on the front end of this committee hearing. So, Alderman Ryan, if you have more from your from a presentation perspective that you'd like to offer the committee before going into questions, now would be the time to do that. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, I guess I'll uh, just go over some of the, the, the bigger uh, changes. Um, so we, uh, we, we have, um, there's a 24 seven contact person for all short term rentals who signs an affidavit, that agent must be able to respond to any issues within an hour, uh, failure to respond to an issue can lead to revocation of the permit. Uh, whether that's, uh, you know, a, a plumbing issue or a party or uh, whatever it is, one of the things that we've seen is particularly out of state LLCs who own short term rentals, it can be very difficult to figure out who to actually contact when there's an agent there. Um, there's um, uh, we we added uh, language that a property can't have any city violations at all when it gets a permit. Um, so the, it'll have to be essentially in perfect shape. Um, we can, uh, we, we added language to ensure that every city department, not just the police department can submit notice of violations that a property has had. Uh, we uh, added language that the platforms themselves must delist properties uh, where the uh, permit has been uh, suspended or revoked within seven days. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I would uh, like to turn it over to Sarah Baker to to address um, the uh, to address other changes that I, I've been jumping around a little bit. So um, to address other changes that that we instituted. With that, we can hear from Sarah Baker. Sarah, do you mind introducing yourself to the committee and the general public? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Baker. I am the Deputy Chief of Staff to Mayor Jones, um, and I've been working with Alderman Narayan on this legislation. We are uh, delighted that you're taking the opportunity to move forward with the short-term rental legislation. Uh, this is a pressing issue for our city. I know we've shared with you all before many of the incidents that have occurred that SLMPD has tracked at these locations. Um, Alderman Narayan did a great job of going over, uh, I believe, the, the numbers, 33 changes that is in that are in the committee sub. Um, a couple that I'd just like to emphasize, um, I think an Alderman Ryan might have spoken to it, but one uh, that I think deserves uplifting is that we added that a short-term rental agent must respond within an hour and failure to respond can result in revocation of that permit. So really making sure that someone is on site and handling these properties, not just that you're dealing with a company. Um, we also went through in detail the feedback that was provided by the Realtors Association regarding their sort of line by line concerns. Um, and that was one of the areas that we clarified around when a platform has to delist a property and we landed on within seven days. So they would get the revocation notice from us that that property needs to be delisted and it would have to be removed from all sites and that permit number would not be in use uh, within seven days. And we also are trying to make it easier for neighbors to understand where these short-term rentals are and how to address them directly. So one of the things we added was that all short-term rental platforms are gonna be posted on the city's website. And there will also be a public registry, both of the revoked permits. So you'll know if your neighbor is operating a short-term rental and they should not be allowed to do so. Um, and there will also be a list of all the short-term rental permitted properties in the city. So you will be able to see if there is a proper permit given to that location or not. And I think that will help a lot to add transparency to this process so that neighbors have a better understanding of where these short-term rentals are and how to get them addressed quickly, working through both the short-term rental agent and, of course, through our apparatus within the city to manage the complaints uh, that may come forward on short-term rentals and get those permits revoked if they do pose a hassle to community. Um, I don't know if you want me, Alderman Narayan, to address the question on occupancy permit or how we're approaching that order? Uh, yes, please do. Okay, um, so for occupancy permits and being required for short-term rentals, we can find that on page 12, line three uh, in the regulation section, section seven. 
um, I'm scrolling down to that. So in that section, we lay it out kind of twice. Um, first in B, we say short-term rental shall be available only for the occupancy load determined by the building commissioner in accordance with the city's residential code. And all of these regulations are required in order to have your permit. Um, and then we also say that the uh, short-term rentals shall only be available for the occupant, oh, sorry, the line above it of uh, that we shan't use it for parties. Uh, we say that there shall be no food service, um, but occupancy load is one of those things that's included in here as uh, determining if you are able to get a short-term rental permit or not, uh, because we of course don't want short-term rental locations to you know, have a one bedroom apartment and say, but we can hold 15 people, which is why we also made provisions around um, that the limiting the uses of those spaces as well. If we want more detail on how occupancy load is determined, I think Frank Oswald is on the call and able to answer that question. That is something that his inspectors do in the field. Alderman Narayan, I'll let you finish with your presentation before asking questions or moving on to that. So if you would like to proceed with your presentation, if there's other members you'd like to have before us, please let us know. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, yeah. Commissioner or Director Oswald is on the call. Uh, I, I would like to have him uh, address that question if uh, if it pleases the chair. Sure. If you know, as as part of this, if you have any other folks you'd like to have as part of your presentation, if we could let the clerk know so we could just be organized and having them all present on this side of the present the, the side of the Zoom call. Um, I think it would be helpful. Do you have any other members you'd like to have as part of your presentation? I believe that is everyone. Okay, Madam Clerk, would you please mind bringing over um, Frank Oswald? Okay, Alderman Ryan, you're okay. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Director Oswald, if you could please weigh in on uh, how your inspectors determine occupancy in the field, please. Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, will we, we plan on doing this the same way we do with our housing conservation inspections. Essentially, you need a certain amount of square footage for living and eating purposes, that type of thing. Uh, your bedrooms are based upon the size, uh, like you need 70 square feet for the first occupant and 50 square feet for the second occupant. So basically a 10 by 12 bedroom allows for two people in that particular uh, bedroom. So, you know, like a two bedroom apartment generally is gonna have an occupancy load of, you know, four people, sometimes three, if it's a very small second bedroom. And uh, that's kind of it, it's relatively simple. Uh, thank you. Um, it's for it's based on square footage. Yes. Um. Yeah. With with, with that, um, I'll, I'll say that uh, again that this is the the culmination of many years of work that uh, many people uh, uh, that we currently serve with have gone through, and and um, you know the like I stated that the votes were there at the end of last session. I know that we we moved from twenty eight to fourteen, and we have new colleagues which is why this uh, was filed and why we made many, many changes to it because we also have uh, that, that late mover advantage that I referred to earlier. Uh, we've been able to see what, what has worked in other jurisdictions and what has not worked. Um, and with that, uh, I'm happy to, to answer any questions and I hope that uh, you'll support uh, moving this out of committee into the full board uh, for for further work today. Thank you, Alderman Ryan. So I think I think my uh, my uh, position as chair, my privilege here to ask a few more questions here. So with regards to the occupancy permit, um, I see where Sarah Baker outlined it, uh, the occupancy load being referred to in the bill. Is there anything requiring an annual occupancy permit, uh, as we had discussed in the last committee hearing in the bill? So that is laid out in the permitting process itself. Uh, when you get that annual permit, it, it, there's an inspection involved in that permitting process. Do you have the permitting process for us to review, Alderman Ryan? 
Um, uh, Sarah or Frank, could either one of you weigh in on that? The, 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 the nuts and bolts of the actual permitting process? It's in um, section five, where it talks about application for short-term rental and what is required for an application for short-term rental. It's actually, it actually starts in section four, the short-term rental permit. And these are general restrictions. And then it goes into section five, which is the application for short-term rental occupied. And then I believe section six um, is the uh, application for short-term rental non-occupied. Uh, so in the most basic sense, to try to cover both of those in one go, uh, you're required to pay a fee. You're required to have an inspection. If it's not your property, you're required to provide uh, proof that the property owner has agreed that you can use it as a short-term rental. You're required to provide that short-term rental agent contact information. Uh, you're required to provide um, an acknowledgement that you understand that you can't use it for a party location. Um, you... Yeah, and then you have to apply for that and receive your permit number on a yearly basis. There are some distinctions in the application process based on if you are the owner living there and it's your owner-occupied short-term rental, or if you are not living there. If you are living there, we're also asking you for um, verification that that is your residence uh, through taxes, through earnings tax receipts. So Sarah, I'm sorry, I, this is just one little point, but it still didn't answer my question. I mean, the annual inspection from the building division is something that I'm, I'm still not seeing in the bill. Um, so I okay, if you refer to us, but I mean, we're kind of dancing around the issue. I'll leave that on the table and go on to some of the other questions I have because, you know, we Alderman have- Spen or Alderman Spencer, if I might, it's line six on section okay. five, applicants for short-term rental permit for a short-term rental occupied shall submit on an annual basis an application for short-term rental permit. In order to get that permit, you have to have an inspection. Right, but it doesn't say that you have to have that annually. For example, you could rent an apartment and have an occupancy. I have an occupancy for my home that I got when I bought this house 10 years ago. So I do have an occupancy permit that's good from 10 years ago, but it isn't, it isn't an annual inspection that I get. I have an occupancy permit. I have an occupancy load, which can be referred to. But it does nothing says there's nothing in here that requires the annual or the annual inspection we discussed in our last meeting. Um, there again with the one night minimum, I, I think it's really important to codify that, not just refer to receiving a permit. I think it's very, it's very important with regards to the occupancy of a space. Um, you know, I don't know, the Kansas City uh, ordinance that was recently passed is very clear. There are two persons per bedroom maximum um, with a maximum of eight. One of the things that we run into is these large party spaces that have these large, la large public areas as a part of the unit. And so if we're going directly by square footage, you can have a two bedroom unit that has an enormous public space and allow for by square footage, 10, 12, 15 people. Um, and so I think it's really important to kind of tie that to the bedrooms as Kansas City and many other cities have done with a total cap, which, with a cap included, which we do not have in our current bill, a cap that caps the number of people in any short-term rental at any given time. Kansas City used the number eight. One of the other things we have discussed, which is not as far as I can tell as part of the bill, is limiting the number of short-term rental units in a geographical area in a zoning or by building. So for example, the Kansas City ordinance that was recently passed limits multifamily buildings to 12.8% um, used as short-term rentals. What they have done in Kansas City, and I should ask Alderman Ryan if you've read the recent Kansas City um, ordinance, because it's they, they, they're not only under state law, the same state law that we are, but they've taken two bites of this apple. So they passed a short-term rental bill uh, to, to a year and a half ago, and then now they've come back and revised it this summer. Um, and they've included some really, really good protections for the community. They have two different types of permits there, one for the owner-occupied, not excuse me, one for the residents of the city and one for outside residents. And they limit the number of short-term rentals for folks that live outside of the city, which I think is very, very, very helpful, specifically in a city like St. Louis, which is the last city to take on regulations because we have a ton of investors coming to the city, investing in St. Louis short-term rental market because we have no regulation. We have an enormous number of them, I think 35 Hundred just on Airbnb and VRBO alone, whereas Kansas City has less than 2,000. And they're a much bigger geographically speaking city than we are. 
So um, there's a couple of other, as far as the limits, have you, we, we do not have anything regarding limits in the bill. Is that correct or am I missing that? If you're looking at overall limits uh, in, within a geographical area, we did not include that uh, because we've seen that be a point of litigation in a lot of other jurisdictions. I am aware that it's in the Kansas City model. Uh, I think uh, what we're trying to do here is uh, get some, some regulations in place and avoid litigation. Uh, I'm happy to let our counterpoints in Kansas City argue with the tech platforms and the courts on that one and we can see how that turns out for them. Uh, the tech platforms have uh, been uh, very open about the fact that that's uh, an issue that they're willing to litigate. Uh, they've seen it, we've seen that in other jurisdictions. What I'm trying to avoid with this uh, legislation is uh, passing a piece of feel good legislation that's then tied up in the courts for several years while short term rentals remain unregulated. I think if we were to pass something like uh, the current proposal, then we have some regulations that are in place. We can move then to, to tinker on the margins and to try some new ideas. Uh, but I, I'd like to see us utilize tried and true ideas that we know are effective at regulating the market before we try more avant-garde ideas, because right now we have no regulations in place. As, as you noted, that's Kansas City's second uh, short-term rental regulation. So in the event that, um, any part of that would uh, be held up in court that there, there there is still regulations right now we are in the wild west in the city of st louis when it comes to short-term rental regulations and i think it's imperative that we get something in place especially since we know that it's going to take the building division some time to get things uh, ramped up uh, to get actual enforcement in place um, i i think that we could be chasing what other cities are, are, are trying to do uh, indefinitely. Uh, like you stated, we've seen uh, other cities that, that moved on this issue uh, years back. Uh, some are in their, their you know, third iteration of this. Right now, we don't have anything. And there's, there's not, um, we, we have seen what the platforms are willing to really push the, uh, the envelope on. And Kansas City is getting sued on, on this. And so I don't know why we would pass legislation that we know is immediately going to end up in the courts. Well, Alderman and Ryan, I agree entirely that we have got to take action and that we are the wild, wild west, which is why I have been pushing consistently, constantly all summer to have hearings, to move this forward. Um, and, and now that we have a bill, you know, I mean, I think that it's our responsibility to make sure that you're that we don't pass feel good legislation that there are some real teeth that the one night minimum is codified that we do codify the required annual inspections that some of these things are you know to to say that limits um on numbers of airbnbs in a building is is avant-garde i think is really dismissing what could be very meaningful limitations on buildings i mean we have certainly cer certain circumstances in which people are living in a building and they're the only actual resident, um, long-term resident, and they're surrounded by the traveling folks, which can be extraordinarily detrimental to quality of life. There's a couple of other things that I think um, the Kansas City Bill that has done that is really, really helpful are, are some other issues that have come up in previous hearings that have not been incorporated. Limiting, for example, um, um, short-term rentals out of um, buildings or projects that have steady incentives. So getting a tax abatement and then, and, and then running a, an Airbnb out of it um, or other sorts of tax, abate, uh, tax incentives. Uh, low-income housing, um, you know, ensuring that low-income housing is reserved for our low-income residents. We have a shortage of how of low income um, housing in our city um, and, and making sure that we do not have uh, Airbnb is running out of that. I know we have certain, several instances of those happening right now. Um, one of the other you know, enforcement and punishment of some of these provisions is not clearly outlined in my opinion. Um, if we're looking at the permit process, what happens if you're operating a short-term rental without a permit? Um, you, the, the revocation exists, um, but what is the what is the punishment if someone does rent without a permit? What happens if they're it, what it, what is the repercussion of an individual renting out with a platform that isn't doesn't have a permit? There are so many of these new platforms that are running amok throughout our nation and throughout the world right now that what well, you know we don't have any as far as I can tell um, real punishments 
outlined, codified, not at the building division, not at the building commissioner's discretion, but clear to the public of uh, 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 reper repercussions of doing some of these things, um, per transferring permits, for example, um, or you know, um, or operating outside of of of, of, of the the. The, the existing permitting process. Alderman Ryan, if you would like to speak to that. Um, sure, sure. So uh, the platforms themselves also must get a uh, a permit to operate uh, within, to, to rent properties within uh, the city of St. Louis. And so we would ban the platform if they're posting properties without permits. Okay, so what happens if you have somebody who's using a banned uh, a platform? We we can't prevent the internet. This isn't um, a you know we. we, we I, I agree with you there. So, but what happens to the individual? There's no punishment or repercussion for the individual fine or otherwise. Kansas City, for example, has a a a, a two hundred to one thousand day up to eight you know, uh, up to a certain number of days in prison for operating without a registration and every day operating without the registration would could be construed as a separate offense um, and and tacked on this is a very very simple fine and operation structure that we can very very easily adopt and put into our bill if we want to get serious about requiring operators to operate within the law so we we have a $500 fine per violation on that, which is what, what we really can, can do under our charter. And that's page 16, line five. That is a violation violating the code, but operating outside of the code. You know, which is a violation of the code, if you're operating outside of the code. Okay, so do do we feel confident that so this is the page page sixteen line fully adjudicated violations prosecuted in municipal court. So, I mean, is there any structure of fine or fee through the building division that doesn't include going through the court system? We 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 can't. I mean, this is America. We can't find people without due process. Our building division does it all the time. Uh, that the, they refer things over to to the municipal you, I mean you can pay it without going to the municipal court but you always have the option to go to court to contest any fines but we don't require violations be adjudicated or prosecuted with the municipal court for overgrown leads or other other fines that the city issues on a very regular basis I, I'm, I'm not sure I follow what you just said um, as far as I understand this this legislation requires that in order for a fine, to be assessed related to short-term rentals. Fully, it, it says here, fully adjudicated violations prosecuted in municipal court will be assessed a $500 fine. So it's yes. my reading that these violations must be adjudicated within municipal court. And my point is that the city of St. Louis issues violations and fines for all sorts of violations like excessive weeds, mowing, um, other many, many, many other things without the requirement that they have to go through the municipal court system, which is- that, that's, that's where the, the citation is, a municipal court citation. If your grass is overgrown and you get a citation, that citation is for you to either pay the fine or go to the municipal court regarding that issue. So going back to the question about limits, um, you, your position is that um, it's an avant-garde um, aspect of the of, of short-term rental re regulation. And it's well, no, what I'm what I'm saying is that Kansas City is currently litigating that exact issue as a result of their uh, their new regulation. And what if what we're trying to do here is to actually get regulations on the board, and then we can tinker with them once we have some regulation at all. Um, doing uh, uh, utilizing a model that we know is currently in litigation is um, not the way that I would like to do it. Okay. 
I'd like to turn it over to the committee for questions. I've asked several at this point, um, and as Alderman Brown pointed out, I'm sure many members of the committee have some other questions. Um, going down in order of seniority, um, well, there's really only <laughs> three members at this point left. Um, uh, Alderwoman Velasquez. Um, I want to thank Alderman Ryan for taking this bill on. I know it is not necessarily the easiest uh, bill to to take. and I know it's been uh, years in the making up to this point. Um, I think, I mean, my only real, you know, feedback is just to make sure that, um, <clears throat> you know, that there are that we a hear what the public has to say today. If we've got some, I believe we've got adequate people here to that are going to share their thoughts, um, but also to make sure that we just maintain um, that we have a good robust debate on the floor if, you know, if we do pass this out of committee, because I do think um, I had a bunch of people from from the sixth ward testify on the last two hearings. I know that um, we've received tens of emails in the past 24 hours about this bill. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think uh, Alder Chair uh, acting Chair Spencer has asked a lot of questions. I mean, I do think it is important to think about, um, you know, potentially perfect being the enemy of good here without any regulation at all. I think that is important to note. Um, and that setting up a structure and some sort of system is important, especially since we're operating with nothing um, and we're uh, still a major city and we really shouldn't, you know, we, we need to do better. Um, so I don't have any questions for you, Alderman Ryan, that you haven't already answered. Um, I'm sure we will continue this robust debate. Thank you, Alderman Velasquez. Alderman Browning. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Um, thank you to Alderman Narayan for preparing this bill. Again, it's it's been tough and it's going to be tough, but this is what we need to do in order to create a good bill that will serve the people of our city. Thank you to Alderwoman Spencer for taking over the chairmanship of this committee at short notice and uh, keeping things moving. From what we're hearing from constituents, this is a very important issue. It touches on public safety, it touches on affordable housing, it touches on quality of life. It's very important that we get this right. Uh, but I also, I agree with Alderman Narayan that I'd like to get something on the books right now uh, in order to you know, start enforcing some of this. It, it's unacceptable to proceed much longer without any kind of rules because this is ruining uh, living in this city for our residents. And we know we need to retain residents and grow this city. And if you have a out of control short-term rental, you're gonna wanna move. So uh, with that, I have a few questions and uh, I'll start with um, just a, a question of clarification. On page 10, uh, line three through five, uh, it says, provide an acknowledgement and agreement that in a multifamily structure, only one dwelling unit owned by the applicant or one unit which the applicant has a pecuniary interest in may be used for short-term rental by the non-owner applicant. What does that mean in, in plain English? Uh, does that mean that in a sure. multifamily building, only one unit can be rented out? So uh, what, what we're seeking to do there is we, we know that a, a lot of the um, quality affordable housing stock in this city is two family and four family units. Um, and so with that, uh, what we don't want to see is people say, OK, I have four. Uh, I, I, I can utilize four short-term rental units. And so I'm going to buy a four family and all of that's going to be short-term rental. Uh, what it's doing is saying in, in just say a four family for the sake of this discussion, uh, you can have one. And so the, the owner occupant can be there. Uh, so if you live in that building, you can, uh, you know, you can rent a room, you can, you can utilize the owner occupied portion of this legislation. And other than that, only one unit can be a short-term rental. Uh, we think that that's uh, uh, a, a good solution both to the 
um, to the affordable housing front, as well as the idea that those are probably going to be the least likely to be problematic um, short-term rentals because you do have an owner right there on site and uh, the, the owner occupied uh, and that's virtually <laughs> owner occupied as far, you know, you're sharing a wall, but the owner occupied short-term rentals uh, we've found through uh, lots of discussion are virtually never the problem property. Okay, thank you. Um, so just to clarify, and, and I do, I am in favor of, of limiting in multifamily dwellings because you do have more than one neighbor in that situation. Uh, I personally know somebody who lives in a four family where the other three units are short-term rentals and it's awful. Uh, so I wanna avoid that kind of situation. But just to push this a little farther, a 300 unit building, does that mean only one can be short-term rental? Um, I would, uh, let's get Sarah on uh, for that question. I know that she had dug into that exact issue. Um, uh, we had some discussion on that, so I will. Hi, Alderman, uh, Alderman Brown, can you hear me? Um, yes. So the issue that we're trying to confront there is the way that this would be limited would be to say that if you own a, let's say you're in a 300 unit space. If you own a space and you're applying for a permit, you get a permit for you. And if you have another space within there that you want to rent out, you could only rent out one more. Um, I think there is a possibility to continue to explore ways in which we could uh, clarify that language. Um, but I don't, I think this is a good sort of run at it. Um, it. It would require some regulation. It would, um, you know, curtail this Wild West atmosphere that we're in. I think this does go a long way to limit those permits because it is saying, you know, you can own one and have another one within that structure. But I also understand your point of you could have several people who own one and have another within a structure, right? Um, that is something that could exist at the same time. I think this will force some limiting. It won't entirely eliminate the problem. I think there are some other provisions within the legislation that would be very helpful for that though as well. For example, a really easy way to issue your complaints and get those permits stripped away if the prop property does become a nuisance. One thing that we have to be very cautious of when it comes to multifamily structures or really when it comes to regulating property types is not treating different types of property owners differently. Um, so that's the needle that we're trying to thread here. Understood. And, and I think from what I've read in the bill, I think there's a lot that communicates the language of you know, we need these things to stay under control, to stay quiet, that people have a right to the quiet enjoyment of their neighborhood or their building. And uh, if there are issues that that violate that, that the permit could be revoked and we would have that back end mechanism, which to be clear, we do not have at all right now. So there can be shots fired at a property right now and we cannot shut it down until there are multiple instances uh, where police are called and we treat it as a nuisance property. So that's the dangerous thing that, that occurs right now and why we need to get regulation in place as soon as possible. Just putting that out there for everybody. Um, but you did touch on another issue, and that is that say you had a, a huge building uh, and it had one owner occupied and then another non-occupied and then another person did it and then another person did it. Uh, then you have common spaces that get inundated with people who don't live there. Uh, and it ruins the enjoyment of the rest of the building. It also creates a, a security issue because say I move into one of these brand new luxury buildings that's just been built, has all these amenities, uh, has you know open common spaces, including mail pickup and things like that. Well, now you're giving the code out to everybody, everybody who's gonna stay in that place. And unless they're changing codes every single week, you're gonna have a huge security problem on your hands. Uh, and the people who live in that building are not going to feel like that access code to get in that building means anything. So uh, I do want to see that we that we tighten down on that and make sure that we're really making sure that we're not uh, issuing permits in places that that could create a security issue for the rest of the residents. Uh, sorry, I see you had have your hand raised. Please please go ahead. 
I think one element that might help there, and I just want to point to it in the legislation, is on page 11, uh, line 8, when we talk about some of the things that are required to get that permit, um, you do have to sign an affidavit that you're not, you know, subject to any contractual restrictions like a homeowner's agreement, like condominium bylaws, restrictive covenants, et cetera. So, for example, in the situation where you're living in one of those luxury condo type places, there could also be in place some sort of restrictive covenant there or some sort of bylaw that would say we can't have short term rentals in this building. Um, and if that's the case, you would never be permitted to have permitted, like as in granted a permit to have a short term rental um, because your condo bylaws prohibit that from being the case. If you did sign that affidavit and we find that you signed that affidavit and you knew that you were in violation of the bylaws of that particular entity, uh, then that's grounds for revocation as well. So that might be helpful um, in addressing that point for you too. I think there's further strengthening needed uh, because there are uh, owners in our city who own buildings in their entirety or own a majority of the units set the bylaws for everybody and then are also in the short-term rental business. Uh, so even four units in that uh, through units that they own or even two units could compromise the security of the rest of the building. Uh, and I'll give you a great example. The EY Walker has had huge issues with this. And we recently found out they don't even have insurance on that building. Uh, so the threat of people coming in that building to stay in the short-term rentals is, is really an incredible threat to everyone else who owns units in that building. Uh, and I, I think there, there's clarification needed. So as we proceed with this, again, I'm okay with moving this out of committee today, only knowing that we're gonna have further debate and be able to make further amendments from the floor uh, to make sure we get this right. And I'm also in favor of seeing how this works and then tinkering with it as we go. Um, because I, I do agree that you know there's things in what in uh, litigation right now that I don't want to I don't want to step on that way in my mind. Um, so on that same vein, are we are we looking to get uh, some sort of or is it not possible to get some sort of limit on geographical proximity of units uh, or? Uh, the ability for neighbors to kind of limit how much is in their area. And I'll give an example. I have places in my ward, I have short blocks that have maybe 10 houses on them. If one person has four units and another person has four units, now almost the entire block is short-term rentals. And even if they're great actors, that's no longer a neighborhood. And sure. I, I, I'm very, I'm very concerned about that. Sorry, go ahead. Um, sure. And so uh, I, I agree with you there. And I, I, I think it would be uh, I, the way that I look at it, that is kind of the, the second bite at the apple. Uh, I, I, I think that that's something that has been challenged frequently, the, the density restrictions. Uh, oftentimes they've been challenged because uh, uh, either operators or the platforms say that they are, uh, in essence, arbitrary, um, that you're, you're not actually looking at who's a good operator, who's not a good operator. It's just basically who was there first. Um, and uh, so I, I would love to, uh, and, and no matter what we pass out uh, with, with the full board, I'm a pretty firm believer that uh, we're going to have to repeatedly come back and readdress this issue until uh, the the short term rental uh, market itself really stabilizes and we we quit seeing real changes uh, there. You know, I think we're going to have to address other types of short term rentals. You know, right now we're addressing housing, but I know that there's you can rent pools by the hour, you can rent yards by the hour. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that at some point, uh, I think we're gonna have to, to, to take a look at. Um, but I think first and foremost, what we need to do is to get some regulations onto the books, start enforcing those, and then look at the outcome of the things that are being litigated. If we are gonna be late movers on this, which we are, we may utilize. We may as well utilize that late mover advantage and not use our legal department and tax dollars and uh, essentially lack of regulations um, uh, 
to, to, to challenge some of these things. We should learn from the early movers and ensure that we do have regulations in place rather than stay orders in place while this market continues to operate uh, completely unregulated. Understood. Uh, so something I think might help really address this situation would be uh, that we bring the limit down to two and require one to be owner occupied and the other non owner occupied to be required to be directly adjacent to so, the owner occupied. So, so I, I, possible? I, 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 so New York just recently did that and they're being sued about it as we speak. That, 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 that's New York's most recent iteration of this is exactly what you're talking about. And that's in litigation right now. Uh, again, I think that might be a, a really interesting second bite at the apple. Um, but I think once the, right now, a lot of cities are in their second and third iteration of this and they're being challenged in court. I think what, <clears throat> what we should be looking at is passing a piece of regulation that we know is going to stand up. And then from there, we can do things. Uh, we, we can look to, to strengthen the, the, the regulations, knowing that even if they are struck down, we, we default back to this one, you know, because of those severability clauses. Um, so in the instance that we, we want to be more bold and we want to try that if the litigation looks like it's going great in New York and the, the people here in the city say, hey, we want that New York model, um, we, we can just tack that on. But then if a Missouri judge disagrees, uh, we'll, we'll fall right back to, uh, to regulation that is, in essence, tried and true. Okay. Um, I, I do oh. think at a certain point, people can sue over anything, right? So there's going to be litigation and I'm sure there will be some litigation on our bill. Uh, but that being said, we do have an obligation to do our best effort right now uh, to get something in place. And I'd like to see us be ambitious. Uh, there's a natural incentivization for uh, an owner occupied unit to keep that unit in order. Uh, if they're the direct neighbor of that unit, there's an incentivization to keep that an orderly unit. Uh, the, the more units we add, and I think if there's any cap in, in general, that cap is debatable. And so you could limit it down uh, to two units and even require where those units are, help prevent that, uh, that effect where a neighborhood gets inundated with them. I represent the Central West End. The data I've seen shows that that neighborhood has more short-term rental units in it than any other neighborhood in the city. It is a crisis. Uh, it is ruining the enjoyment of the neighborhood for people. It is making them feel like they're not home. Uh, and it makes, uh, like we, as we discussed, it's a public safety issue uh, as well as an affordable housing issue. It, there's just so much that we need to get done here. Uh, that is why I think we do need to move this forward, uh, and I encourage people to continue reaching out to us. I want to hear from people about what they think we can improve on this, but there also is an urgency to this. We can't we can't debate this until the end of time, uh, and you know leave people in the lurch while we do it. So uh, that's that's why I'm in favor of moving this forward today. But I, I want people to continue to reach out to us, and I want to make sure that we are. Uh, listening and prepared to make amendments on the floor of the full board. Okay, um, well, thank you, uh, Alderman Browning. Um, I want to kind of re reiterate a couple things. The city of Bustian's 300 lawsuits a year. So we get sued, as Alderman Browning said, all the time. I agree, we, want, we should be ambitious. The, the New York uh, law that was challenged in court withstood a challenge just earlier this year and uh, you know it was considered a huge win for the hospitality industry because the new york judge rejected the legal challenge as far as i can tell and the city began re enforcing the law lo known as local law 18 on short-term rentals on september 5th of 2023 so as far as i know 
Um, that's been a huge win for New York. Um, and, and it's you know, survived the legal challenge and the underlying local law regulations now may, may be used as a model for other local governments seeking to curb short-term rentals. And so, I mean, you know, to me, I think the committee process is the process through which we take public comment and we really do the work of legislating. And I think to, to pass the buck to the full, you know, without doing that, we told the public in the July hearing, July 11, that we would have more robust public hearings. We did not hear from, we did not get a new bill all summer. Two and a half months later we are. And I realized the urgency. That's why I was calling for action the entire summer on this bill. Calling for action and a new bill literally all summer long. And now here we are, two and a half months later, calling for emergency action of the committee, bypassing public input. We're taking robust public input on everything under the sun right now. Yet last night, we spent two hours hearing from the public about how they want us to hear from the public on RAM settlement funds. Kansas City did a robust public engagement on their short-term rentals that included input from almost 2,000 residents hearing from what they wanted with regards to public you know, uh, uh, on their short-term rentals. We have models. Uh, the New York is, it, is not just a avant-garde piece of legislation. It was stood a, a challenge. And for me, I think to push the envelope, we, we have there's no reason for a city being the latest bloomer on the planet on, 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 on short-term rentals to be continuing to make to, to, to have to start at the bottom of the barrel. You know, we have run amok and it's time to rein these things in. And I would argue that any lawsuit um, on short-term rentals would cost us less than continuing to go down this path of letting these parties, et cetera. I, I think it's a big oversight to not have a requirement that no more, that, that, that the, the one night stay not be, a, you know, a requirement, um, you know, that that to, to pass it out of committee today is basically just to tell the public, yeah, we wanted to hear from you. We told you we were going to continue to hear from you, but we decided that we didn't want to do that all summer long and we didn't want to put something new before you and we just want to move forward. And I think, you know, considering that um, over the last 24 hours, I have received dozens, dozens, literally dozens of emails just with these short notice. I call this hearing Alderman Ryan out of respect for the fact that we finally have a committee substitute to start to hear it and to put it before the general public. But it was not my intention to take a vote without hearing more from the public who, you know, there are, as Alderman Browning pointed out, a lot of issues, big issues, the constraints, the um, limitations, the restrictions, the geographical considerations that we have not included in this bill. And, you know, Passing it out of the committee tells the general public, we no longer want to hear from you in official capacity. The hearing process for you is over. And, you know, this bill does not even go into effect for one year. We have been passing the buck and mocking around with this thing for four years. And I, I fail to see how one more week to give the general public a, an opportunity to weigh in. You know, I mean, Limiting the low-income housing, you know, the the the, the use of low-income housing and, and taking it that off the market for, for short-term rentals, I think is an important consideration. I think you know, limiting the total number of buildings, you know, the total number within, you know, um, within a short-term rental by the bedrooms and having an overall cap. I think, you know, there's nothing in here that, for example, limits the limits on the building are simply limits for the owner as opposed to if you have a condo so the building like the Eli Walker situation where you have tons of owners, you can have the whole building could be filled with, with short-term rentals in that situation. There's nothing preventing that. And I think that can create ghost hotels and ghost situations and really, really untenable situations for, for us to live in. Look, the city is losing population. We are failing to address the people who live here and making life livable for our residents. The US Census published data earlier this year for all municipalities with more than 50,000 people. There are 798 municipalities in the United States with more than 50,000 people. And the city of St. Louis is 797. There is only one place in the United States that's losing population faster than the city of St. Louis and it's a small town in Mississippi. We have got to serve our residents. And speaking of feel good legislation, if we don't get this right, that's all this is going to be is feel good legislation. We should be taking examples from New York, from Kansas City and from other things. And, and Alderman Ryan, I appreciate the work here 
and and I appreciate some of the changes, but I do think that passing it out of committee without giving the, the public an opportunity to weigh in one more time on some of these changes and the lack of the, the restrictions and the geographical, you know, the, the, the restrictions on, on human beings and a property is, is an oversight. And frankly, it's it, we told the public we would do that. And so I respectfully request that we take one more week, we, can, we, we put a hard stop, and we vote on it next week, but that we give the public one more opportunity to weigh in because we did tell them in July that we would do that. And we failed to do that over the, the break. We didn't have something to put before them. And there's a citizen group that's just getting a ton of press this morning about a new bill. And we should at the very least hear what they have to say, because this is something that has been festering and festering and festering for far too long. So um, um, as, the, as the sponsor of the bill, I'm requestfully requesting that we give this one more week and that we allow the public to weigh in one more time on this very important issue, recognizing that one week and the year plan that you have to put this into effect um, is not that great, big in the grand scheme of things. And we have been waiting four years to get this done and we have got to get it done right. Uh, <clears throat> and to, to that, uh, I, I would respectfully disagree with you. I, think that we laid out at the beginning of this committee process that we we're going to have three hearings on this and and try and get something out. This is that third hearing. Um, we, we took, uh, I, I, there's very few bills that have gotten as much uh, uh, public input as this bill has. We had two very well attended, fairly high profile, well publicized committee hearings on this. We've gotten many, many emails. Uh, we, we've talked about it in uh, neighborhood associations for years. Um, and uh, what, what we're going to end up with is the same thing that's, that's happened before over and over. We, we've done town halls on this. Um, we, we did an online survey on this. Um, th th this is years and years of work that this is the culmination of that work. And uh, what, what, I want to avoid is to continue being bogged down. What we need is to get some regulation in place. And I guarantee you to anyone out there who has additional concerns, if the mayor signs this bill, the next day, I'll get to work with you on the next piece of short-term uh, uh, rental legislation because we'll know uh, we, we know that there's going to be more work on this, but to, to say we need to get a perfect bill before we get out of committee, we just can't do that. There's too many moving parts here. And while we sit and debate this in committee, it's the Wild West out there. And we know that there's going to be a period of time for the building division to gear up to actually enforce this. I want there to be enforcement on this as soon as possible. And uh, we, we've had an, a, an incredible amount of public input on this. And I, I fear that if we don't at some point say, like we did at the beginning of this process, here's, the, here, here's kind of the, the bumpers. We're, we're going to do three meetings. And at the end of the third meeting, we're going to have a vote. Uh, that's that's the way that this was laid out from the beginning, and that's what I intend to do. Um, it, 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 and uh, you know, if people can disagree with me, that's 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 what votes are for. Um, but uh, I I would like to uh, move both thirty three and thirty four to the full board for further consideration, so that we can get it on the mayor's desk sooner rather than later, uh, so that we can get some regulation in place. Uh, while we sit discussing the finer points of this, there is absolutely no regulation in place. The, the losers here are the people of the city of St. Louis uh, who, who want to live in a neighborhood with some regulation on this, who want to have uh, th these public safety concerns addressed, who want to have the affordable housing issues addressed. And I, I don't want to continue to sit here, you know, playing violin on the Titanic while, uh, well, as you noted, uh, we're losing population uh, as a result of some of these issues. I think it's inherent on us after years, years, literally years of public input on this to act. Uh, and with that, 
uh, I would ask that this bill gets passed out of this committee with a due pass recommendation. Alderman and Ryan, where was the urgency for the last two and a half months? Where was the urgency all summer long to get this done? That's what I would like to know. You know, I mean, where was the public? I mean, we told the public, if your intention was to simply have three bills, three hearings, then why at the last meeting did you we did tell the public that we would continue to be hearing from them in committee? That's disingenuous, in my opinion. It was never my intention as the chair to move forward in that way. And if that was your intention, that should have been communicated ahead of time. And we should have had this bill all summer long and had public engagement and described to the public what we planned and didn't plan to do, what, how we had planned to do this. And we failed to do that. And, you know, I just think if, if the urgency is here today, where was it in July? Where was it in August? Where was it the first half of September? I certainly felt it. I was certainly sending emails and requesting these hearings and moving forward. So, you know, it's my intention to continue to hear from the public one, one, I think one more week. Your bill doesn't even go into effect for a year. And with all due respect, describing New York without knowing the outcome here, we have some real models to move from. And to me, we have got, we owe it to our public after years and years and years of debates to include all these things, not just in the whereas clauses, but in the meat of the bill. Alderman Brian, do you have your hand up? Do you have a comment? Uh, yes, I just wanted to make sure that we are moving these one bill at a time because I do have questions about 34. Thank you. Do we have any further discussion? We have, we are considering board bill 33. Alderman Browning, if you don't mind stating your question on board bill, is it, is it related to the movement of board bill 34 or is it related to the content of board bill 34? Uh, in his statement, Alderman Narayan said 33 and 34. I just want to ask a clarifying question that we are only moving uh, to pass 33 out of committee at this moment. We have a motion to put Board Bill 33 before us. Board Bill 33 is before us, but we do not have a motion to move it at this time, Alderman Narayan. Okay, I'm would you like to make that motion? I, I was not entertaining that motion at this time. Excuse me. So the first request that we put forth was when the motion was made by um, Narayan and seconded by Browning, that was to put board bill number 33 committee substitute before the correct. committee? Yes. For discussion. Thank you, Madam Clerk, for clarification. Mm -hmm. That is correct. So Alderman Ryan, it's my, it's Alderman, uh, excuse me, Alderman, Alderwoman Velasquez, do you have your hand raised? I, Chairwoman, would you entertain a motion to vote on board Bill 33? Um, Alderwoman Velasquez, it is my express desire not to do that during this committee. Um, as I have stated over and over again, I think we owe it to the general public, the dozens of emails that I think you received. I know I have received dozens um, asking for additional public comment and additional considerations with the bill. Um, I think it would be a really huge disservice to the public to not give them that opportunity to weigh in one more time. I just want to make it clear that that's your decision. I mean, I think there is, um, frankly, there's been a lot of discussion uh, outside this committee about uh, this bill and about the timing of bringing this bill um, to the public today, which I believe that um, was part in your decision making. So. You know, I think that we've talked about it as a committee. I agree with Alderman Browning and some other folks here on this call that uh, we've had robust public engagement. We will continue to. I think we all I understand that this that this bill gives our colleagues also the opportunity to weigh in because the short term rentals affect um, everybody in the city more broadly than just the wards on this call. Um, so I just want to make it clear that, you know, I would be in favor of voting for this bill today. Um, I think others would, and that, you know, you do not want to entertain that motion today. Alderman Browning, do you have a point? Uh, yes, I just want to, if we're not going to entertain a motion today, uh, then I want to get clarification that uh, one more meeting uh, scheduled exactly a week from this date uh, would be acceptable and that we'd move to vote on this uh, one week from today. 
that would be my intention, Alderman Browning. I'm I'm the vice chair of this committee. Um, I'm disappointed that the sponsor of the bill would want to move forward without giving the 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 one additional hearing of public engagement that we promised in the last hearing. Um, you know, I called this meeting simply to put the committee sub out of respect for getting this, at, you know, at the 11th, you know, at, in in September here. Um, you know, but you know, this is. You know, my intention as the chair of this committee is not to hold up the process, uh, much to the chagrin of some of our uh, less ro uh, uh, fact seeking um, publications in our city news outlets. Um, and so, you know, if the chair, if the sponsor of the committee, uh, excuse me, if the sponsor of the bill, you know, uh, feels strongly that this that he doesn't want to hear from the public anymore and would like to move forward with this despite the um, holes I pointed out and the issues I think that we need to make this stronger um, then you know it is not the intention of the chair to continue to hold up a, a bill that has been held up for years and really in my opinion still needs a lot of work uh, to be to to make our residents feel confident and comfortable in in living in our city and living among uh, the the Airbnbs that have really quite frankly run them off in our communities. Okay, so I think it's the discretion of the chair to in order to not entertain a vote. So uh, if the compromise going forward here is that we have one more meeting, then then we'll have to have one more meeting. I, that's that's how I understand the rules. Uh, so with that, should we move discussion to uh, board bill 34? Um, I will entertain a motion to just to table board bill 33 and move to discuss board bill 34. Just, just a quick point of order. Uh, tabling a bill is... Uh, Excuse me. Thank you, Alderman Ryan. Uh, to to um, put board bill thirty three um, um, to the side without tabling it, uh, but simply to have discuss to move to discuss board bill thirty four. So you, we're going to hold board bill number three. We're going to hold that in committee for right now. For right now, thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, and I'll take a motion to put board bill thirty four before us. Uh, Alderman Browning, would you make that motion, please? Uh, Alderman Cohn had his That's hand. His hands up. I think Alderman Cohn is uh, recusing himself from this topic. So just for um, cleanness, Alderman Browning, do you mind making that motion? Just... Uh, yeah, just one second. I'm just <laughs> okay. Um, does does any uh, do we want to entertain any questions from the rest? Uh, any other alders present before we move away from thirty three? Thank you, Alderman Browning. We can do that. Um, I didn't see any hands raised, but Alderman Sonia now has her hand raised. Alderman Sonia, did you have a question or a comment on Board Bill 33? Hi. Yes. Um, I, first of all, thank you to the sponsor for having this bill. Um, I've appreciated this conversation and, and getting into it. Um, it's also really interesting to see it. This is my first time seeing uh, like a motion not be entertained. I never, I, this is my first time seeing that. So that's that's interesting to see as well. Um, I also just wanted to say too, I think Alderman Cohn, I know he's recusing himself, but I think he should be given space if he does want to make any comments. I think he's recusing himself from votes and he's revealed his conflict of interest. He still has a right. I would advocate for him to still have a right to say something and add whatever he would like to the conversation because even though he's not going to vote I have constituents you know it's good too and then I just want to add to the what happened happened in Power Grove East that I had the pleasure of representing and we also have you know one of the areas in the city that are like very highly saturated with short-term regulated properties and they actually have a neighborhood meeting tonight and um have gotten tons of emails from them and outreach from them of saying you know we want to see action from this and we feel like like what's going on is are you all stalling it so i just wanted to you know again just express that there is some folks who are some who have some urgency around this issue who know that this has been a conversation long before some of us have even been elected and are looking for to move on. So I just want to make sure that that urgency was a part of the conversation and noted and also make sure that if Alderman Conan wanted to comment, I think he should still have the right to give comments. Oh, of course, Alderwoman Sonia, thank you for bringing that up. I mean, all aldermen are always welcome to comment during any committee hearings. 
um, the protocol is generally just to raise your hand and always, uh, certainly as the chair or even acting chair, I would always entertain um, um, any comment from any 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 alder person as I just did for you, Alder Woman Sonia. So um, if Alderman um, Cohn is, comes back to the committee, I don't see him on here anymore, but certainly if he raises his hand, I thought it was raised and immediately taken down, which happens, uh, you know, uh, technology, you can accidentally hit a button, but certainly um, if Alderman Cohn or any member of the Board of Aldermen has any comments at any time, uh, they will always be entertained by me as chair or acting chair. Um, and with that, Alderwoman Velasquez, and, and there was a, there were, yeah, Alderwoman Velasquez, did you have a comment or a well, question? Just, just quick question. If we're moving, if we're going to move to hear Board Bill 34, are we not having public comment on 33? Um, you know, there was some publication. I think it was, um, you know, I didn't feel like public comment was, we gave the public any notice. I mean, this this committee hearing was just called um, and there was- I mean, there's no 35 participants on this call. So I don't know if any of them are from the public. I just thought that with all the discussion about that we had earlier, that that seems pretty germane to today. Yeah, Alderwoman Velasquez, I mean, my intention at the beginning of this hearing was to, to actually give the public notice of public hearing um, by way of, you know, some public announcement and to give the, the concept some due course. Um, I'm disappointed that that doesn't clearly seem to be the intention of the sponsor of the bill um, or the committee for that matter. Uh, but certainly, um, you know, if there's members, if, if any member wants to speak today, um, could reach out to the clerk and we could move them over. Um, you know, again, it's not my intention to hold this up. You know, I, I, I'm really disappointed that we sat on this all summer without having any, without having any public you know, you know, hearings on this. Um, and so, you know, and I, I feel like we still have work to be done, especially in light of the, the decision in New York. Um, with that being said, you know, I, I did, there, there, what I have intended to do at this point is to just put aside Board Bill 33 for the moment. Um, uh, and uh, just a quick point of order. I, I know that we had put Board Bill 33 uh, committee sub did, did we vote to actually get the committee sub in front of us? I'm just trying to remember. We did vote to get the board okay. the sub cool. before Alderman and Ryan. We did that at the beginning of the hearing. And what I was suggesting that we do to hear um, concerns about or questions on board bill 34 was put, um, put board bill 34 before us for that purpose. And if there is any members of the public, I don't feel comfortable moving forward. Um, but it, it clearly the committee feels comfortable moving forward without any more community engagement and without tightening up some of these other pieces. Um, I'm weighing that in as we move through this hearing. There has been no decision made by the chair um, on that, but I am considering Board Bill 34 and the, and the questions there. Um, that being said, before we move out of Board Bill 33, it looks like Alderman um, Al Velasquez, your, your hand is still raised, and then I'll move on to Alderman Aldrich. Yeah, I mean, I would say, I don't know if the clerk has received anything, but I think it just is in the interest of, I mean, I, I, I have people say they were going to try and make the Zoom meeting. I don't know if any of those people are on the call. I know sometimes in the interest of public comments, it's harder to get to two meetings than one. So I would urge us if there are members of the public who want to speak today that before we move on from to board bill 34, and yes, Madam Chair, I know this is at your discretion, I would urge us to hear any of those people if they're here. Thank you, Alderwoman Velasquez. Um, you know, Alderman Aldrich. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, I just want to echo a little bit of what some of my colleagues said. I know, um, I think it's important, like you said, before we move on 33, that we still take uh, um, public input um, just so people can have comment on study uh, that has taken place today. Um, or just comments that maybe they had uh, from previous meetings that they want to echo. And I'm not 100% always on the uh, right with the rules, but I thought with 33, when a motion was made that uh, we still had to entertain that motion, the motion was on the floor and we just kind of bypassed uh, several motions. I know it was a motion to move it. And then um, I think to your discretion, although you said you didn't want to do it, but I thought when the motion's on the floor, we had to take it and then uh, take it up or down. Alderman Aldrich, there wasn't a motion, there was a question about a motion on the table, on the floor, so, or on the floor of the committee at the time. I mean, you know, so, you know, I was expressing my desire as the acting chair of the committee 
Um, I think it's my opinion is that without real public uh, notice, um, taking public comment is not uh, is sort of just ingenuous in that we've really only given folks a couple of days. I would prefer to see a more robust, just one last hearing on and hearing from the public, especially given that just this morning a, a, a citizen group announced some changes they would like to see. I haven't even seen that. I haven't seen the bill or the proposed changes that they would like to see. Any time a group of citizens organizes themselves to provide public comment to a public body, I think it's I think it's um, our 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 um, responsibility to hear from that. But if members of this committee unanimously, besides me, want to move forward without hearing that public comment, it's clear to me that 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 that's not going to make much of a difference in this committee structure. And so um, I can be overruled in that way. I'm, I'm trying to be fair to the public and trying to be fair to the committee and hear all concerns. Um, with that being said, um, Alderman Browning. I just... I'm so sorry, Alderman Aldrich, were you, were you done with your comments? I should give you the floor if you still would like it. No, I was just gonna say, I was looking was looking at the uh, notice so the the meeting is noticed up for public comment um so we have the space to do that and then just wanted to echo um understand that you may not be in favor of it and i get like you said you want the community to have more input i don't think any members on this committee are saying they don't want to have more input as there's been input around this way before uh four of us all the people that just recently spoke was newly elected um that there's been a lot of conversation around this um and just want to Echo, even if you're against it, uh, all, Madam Chair, with respect, I think uh, committee members still have the ability to, uh, if they feel, want to vote it out or make the motion to vote it out, um, even if the chair is not in favor of doing so. Thank you, Alderman Aldrich. Um, I do uh, appreciate that the meeting was noticed, um, you know, it was placed on our website. Um, I know that there are a handful of activists that check that regularly, but um, you know, my preference would be to have a more robust um, public announcement of a public hearing. I just think this issue is so important. You know, as the alderman of the eighth ward, we have so many Airbnbs, and I think there's just so many places missing and so much more we could put in this. Alderman Browning, did you have a comment or a question before moving forward? I just want to make sure that that Alderman Aldridge is not driving uh, that that it's uh, a safety issue and it's a uh, he I okay he's the passenger thank you just wanted to, to verify appreciate you being safe. Um, Plus he was driving a car from the UK. On the left side. Uh, so uh, I I wonder if um, if we can proceed today we should commit to one hearing exactly a week from today uh, and plan on voting on that, make that very clear. Uh, I think that is the compromise that really would move this forward today in a way that would put an end date on this, express some urgency on this, allow the public to take in the bill. Uh, I, I think it's really a, trying to meet everyone's interests here. Um, so with that, I'll make a motion uh, to move to the side board bill 33 so that we may commence with discussion of bill board bill 34. Is there a second on the motion? Alderman, Alderwoman Velasquez, did you have a comment on the motion or discussion on the motion? I do have a comment on the motion. I mean, I do think it's a little equally i mean i do think it's disingenuous to not have to have to not ask members of the public to talk about it even even though we have time to do it before moving this forward especially if we are going to have more time for comment so i just want to say that i'm not seconding the motion um i'm not sure what you mean we've asked the clerk to bring over anybody today that wants to speak before the bill I'm, I'm not sure what you're speaking to, Alderwoman Velasquez. I mean, I guess I haven't heard if 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 there are people. I mean, I haven't. I mean, it, I it sounded like to me that we were saying that we were going to wait to have all public comment when there when, as you described it, there was adequate public notice to discuss things. And so I just want to make sure if there are members of the public here that we're not stopping them from speaking. And then if there's nobody and I missed it and the clerk, um, and we don't have anybody, then. I will second the motion to move to 
34. Of course, yes, we would stop the public from speaking. I would hope that was not even um, perceived in any way, shape, or form. We did we did instruct or ask the clerk. We did instruct anybody who wanted to speak to reach out to the clerk, Ms. Heggs. Um, I, I'm not sure, um, uh, clerk, Madam Clerk, if you've received any um, uh, members of the public. I haven't gotten any any um, notes about that, but certainly if anybody from the public, especially given that it was noticed that way, um, all Madam Clerk, would you mind speaking on that? If anybody's reached out that wants to speak today, I'm not sure where our clerk has gone. Um, there could be a breakdown here. Um, in the I'm here. Thank One you, moment. Yes. Ms. Heggs, do we have trying to get a clarification on what was happening? Because um, I noticed that Mr. Browning said he wanted to make a motion to move or to um, move board bill number 33 to the side, there was no second. But earlier in the conversation, there was Ms. Uh, Spencer, the chair, stated that she wants to hold board bill 33 uh, in committee, which she can do as um, the chair without having to have a first or a second to do so. So I want to know what are we doing and are we gonna move on to just public um, Testimony. I guess my question, Ms. Heggs, is there are there members of the public that are want to comment on 33? I see three, yes. There okay. Are. And I guess that was my question. We can do that before we move on to 34. Okay. I, I withdraw my motion uh so that the public can weigh in on 33 at this time. Okay. Thank you, Madam Clerk. If you don't mind, can you send all three over so we can swear them in all together at one time? Yes. I will. So sorry, Mr. Clerk. I'm here. Okay, so I'm moving them over now. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Do we have their will name? You, yes, I have Amanda McCracken, Les Sturman, Carol Ray. And I now have a Dan Pister. Okay. Will you be swearing them in or would you? Madam Clerk, if you don't mind swearing in all members of the public who wanted to speak today um, okay. at the same time, just for um, time, cons time considerations. And then if you don't mind, um, calling on them in, in the order that they reached out to you and providing the three minute limit that we normally provide. Okay, now I will need to see everyone. And right now I do not see Steve Pona. I don't, I can't see his face. Okay, and so we have Carol Ray. Is Carol Ray on here? Les Sturman. That's a Brad Waldrop. Okay, so right now I'm only seeing Steve Pona and Michelle Pona. Okay, I see Dan Pister. I need for Brad Wardroff, if he wants to testify, he will have to come on to interview. And I, he only has a picture posted. Uh, can you hear me? This Who's is Brad. Speaking? This is Brad Waldrop. I I know you want my video, but for some reason it won't allow me to go to video. My one of my main statements, so is that 
we're fully not prepared to make public comment today because we haven't seen the substitute bill, uh, nor have we been notified that we would be allowed to make public comment today. So I would agree with Alderman Spencer that we need to put this aside and give the public a chance to prepare. Thank you. Alderman Ms. Spencer, so do you want for me to swear in Steve Pona, the ones that I can see? Yes, you can, Alder, uh, sir, Madam Clerk, you can proceed as you'd like. Um, you know, I take your leadership on taking the public comments here. You've done an excellent job in the past. So if you want to just take them in order, you can swear them in all together if we can do that, or we can swear them in one by one. It doesn't take that long. Okay, so for the ones that I can see, those will be the persons that will be allowed to speak today. So again, I can't see Brad Wardoff. I can't see Carol Ray. Um, so who I can see is going to be Les Sturman, Steve Pona, and Michelle Pona, and Dan Pister. So those will be the, and Amanda McCracken. All right, so if you could raise your right hand. Do you affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. I do. Thank you. So we're going to go in order, and it was Amanda McCracken. Rental since 2018. And whenever I, I started my first uh, short-term rentals, I've never had a tr trouble, never. I, they were, they were uh, no complaints, uh, no problems. Um, I've got a whole little corner there. I screen all of my applicants. I've always had a two night minimum. I do not allow uh, instant booking. And I am a very responsible owner. I do not cram my, my guests into one room. I, you know, I have maybe one of my rooms might have two full beds, just like in a hotel, actually two queen beds, just like in a hotel. All of a sudden, four or, you know, five years later, I'm getting lumped into the same category as these problem properties, which I understand, and they should be shut down. And the problem property down the street for me that I just found about, found out about, that should be shut down. But that is not my property and that is not me. So some of these regulations are going to put me out of business. And this is my livelihood. I've been here doing this for five years. I've invited everyone, all of the aldermen, the neighbors to come <clears throat> over, let me show you what I have. My, there's people there now that are moving from Texas to St. Louis and they're staying there so, so they can move easily. There's, I, there's, all, there's no parties. I have never had parties, never had a problem. So my concern is I agree with all of these regulations, but it seems like you're only hearing from the people who may have the loudest voice that are upset whenever you're not really talking to people like myself who have been successful at this and promoted these properties without incident. All of my neighbors that are right next to me, none of them have complaints, none of them. They actually talk to these. What makes a person better if they're only there for three days versus 30 days. So if I have someone there 30 days, then none of these rules apply. I'm not even charged a commercial rate. But if they're there three days, no matter how responsible they are, whether they're medical students from SLU coming back for a reunion or you know whatever, all of a sudden they're bad, they can't stay there. And I have to follow the same occupancy as, uh, a long-term rental, which I don't feel is fair. If I'm going to be paying commercial taxes, let me have two queen beds in a bedroom where there's plenty of space. I have, or like in a kid's room, I may have like a trundle bed or it's just, remember when we have these occupancy levels, most of these people are families. They have little kids. So we're talking babies that count as a person. We're talking five-year-old toddlers that count as a person. I do agree with what you all are doing and I applaud you all. And Ms. Spencer, you did a great job on the news the other night trying to like combine everybody's opinions. 
but I feel like the people who are yelling the loudest are getting the most attention and our rights as owners who I've been doing this way before short-term rental was possible were, were, were popular all of a sudden you're putting me out of business mm -hmm. and I have to figure out okay now what am I going to do so I feel like it should be a case-by-case -case basis I agree with these large companies coming in I am an owner. I live next door to these properties. I'm there. You can look at my reviews. Never had a problem. I mean, never. And I don't feel like I should be punished because of some of these irresponsible owners who don't care because I do care. And yeah. I know my neighbors sorry, down this your three minutes. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Are we taking testimony? Okay. I don't thank you. I just wanted to make sure that we were putting a limit. I don't think I was on the news the other night, but there's a lot of doppelgangers. Oh, it was there. last week. Yeah, it was last week. I have no idea. I don't think I was talking about Airbnbs recently, but um um uh Madam Clerk, if you don't mind calling the next person, thank you for thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Um Steve Pona. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, you know, one of the most alarming things about board bill 33 as proposed is that it, or it actually might be in 34, but it will effectively change the longstanding zoning laws to make any building on any block in any neighborhood throughout the entire city available and open to be a short-term rental. That's, that's unfathomable to me that that would even be under consideration, much less making short-term rentals legal in residentially zoned neighborhoods. So as a point of fact, all short-term rentals operating currently that are, in, that are successful or not, successful operators or not, are operating illegally under a previously known ordinance that prevents boarding houses. So here we're letting this thing run crazy we're letting these, these operators operate illegally, whether or not they're doing it effectively. But the point is every single short-term rental in a residential neighborhood infringes on the character of the neighborhood, the security of the neighborhood, the safety of the neighborhood, and they're doing it at our expense. I also find it challenging, also curious, that the mayor's office is willing to accept feedback from a trade association and not citizens. What's the urgency to push this thing forward? What's the problem with one more week? We'd also like to suggest, and, and for all operators with CO have made comments or will make comments, that we think there is a place for short-term rentals, but it is within the zone, the existing zoning regulations. And there are certain caps, such as to be owner operated, so we don't have multiple short term rentals in the same neighborhood stacked on top of one another. We believe in community over commerce, and we believe that we still have best practices from around the country that we've collected, we've networked, we've worked with politicians and spokespersons from around the country. We have a long list of things that we'd like to present to the committee. We appreciate your consideration. We think there is a common sense solution that accommodates both the industry and still protecting citizens downtown and in the neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pona. Okay, um, we have next uh, Michelle Pona. Hi, I just wanna thank all the committee members um, for holding this meeting and for allowing for some public comment. Um, I was one that sent emails out to committee members last night, um, urging them to please not pass this out of committee yet. Um, the, the public hasn't even seen the current draft of the, of the new bill. We, we need time. But what I wanna focus on today is there are no density requirements in this bill. And as, my husband stated before me, we are homeowners in the Southwest Garden neighborhood. Within 500 feet of our house, we have six short-term rentals. That's a block and a half. We have six properties that are 3,000 square feet or more that have been taken out of the housing stock and are being used as hotels. Since I spoke last, I spoke to all of you during the June hearing in person. 
back in June, Southwest Garden neighborhood had 76 short-term rentals. As of yesterday, uh, as of AirDNA's data, there's 124 in Southwest Garden. We are losing our neighborhood to these transient hotels. The committee needs to take a look and consider the quiet enjoyment of the people who live here, of the homeowners. There are more homeowners than there are short-term rental owners. We need our rights protected. We need our neighborhoods protected. To me, that is the most important part of all of this. My husband and I have been city residents for 20, I've been a city resident for 20 years. My husband has been a city resident for over 55 years. Our rights need to matter. I wanna come home to a safe place. I want to come to a neighborhood. We purchased in a residential neighborhood. We want our neighborhood to stay residential. If we wanted to live next door to a commercial property with people coming and going 24 hours a day, we would not have purchased a home where we did. Again, I'm gonna sum it up by saying, please don't pass this out of committee today. Please let us work with you hear what we have to say. Um, thank you, I appreciate your time. Thank you, we have uh, Dan Pister. Yeah, hi, thank, thank you everyone. Um, I do echo the concerns that others have, have made in regards to uh, not passing the, the bill out of committee at this time. Um, I wanna thank everybody, uh, especially Alder Woman Spencer for advocating for public comment and uh, get, allowing us one more week. Many of us have not seen the substitute yet. Um, so I live, I actually, I don't live, I own a unit in the Eli Walker Lofts and I've seen firsthand the, uh, the, the destruction that short-term rentals can, can have. Uh, we had somebody that was murdered uh, in, the, in our lobby that, uh, that was attending a short-term rental party in one of the units. Uh, so it's very important for, uh, for me that to see some sort of short-term rental legislation moving forward. Um, in, in regards to enforcement, I think the comment I wanna make on that is a lot of the, I hear a lot of talk about the building division and the city doing certain things for enforcement. The enforcement should be uh, conveyed to the platforms. If you uh, approve of the platforms and you give them the criteria in which they have to operate, they should be doing a lot of the policing themselves. If you tell them that they can only list properties that have two night rentals, then that should, uh, that should allow for, you know, that should eliminate a lot of the one night rentals that we have and the city won't have to really police those since the platform does it. So that's important to, to have those platforms approved by the city and, uh, and make sure that there's no unlicensed platforms operating in the city. Um, the one question I have is regarding the sign authorization. Uh, I think it's important not only to just have a signed authorization uh, by the by the person stating that there's no H HOA uh, bylaws that that allow them that allow short term rentals, I think it's important to get you know a an authorization from the HOA president or from the landlord stating that their short term rental is allowed. If if that's the case, we shouldn't be taking the word of the uh, the renter or or the the, the condo owner regarding. Um, um, board bill, uh, 34, I do think it's important that short-term rentals are allowed in, in other parts of the city. Um, if you don't do that, then you're just going to, uh, restrict them to certain high density areas, such as downtown in the central West end. Downtown is one of the most populous neighborhoods in the city. It's one of the most densest, de densest neighborhoods in the city. And, um, if we don't allow them other parts of the city, it's just going to cram them all downtown. And um, we're going to have we're going to have a lot of issues downtown. So I think that is important. So uh, those are my comments regarding short term rentals. Thank you. We have um, Les Sturman. Thank you. Uh, my name is Les Sturman. I've lived in downtown St. Louis for the last eighteen years, and um, I've watched our as our neighborhood has deteriorated, and it's been well documented in the media in large part due to the proliferation of short-term rentals. Uh, this bill would do nothing to stop that. 
Um, let me just say a couple of things that we see down here. Um, we see ghost hotels being created as uh, landlords allow their own renters uh, to rent spaces solely for the purpose of using them as short-term rentals. This bill allows that. It uh, qualifies renters the same as owners. Um, so we have buildings that are turning into what amounts to ghost hotels. Um, you know, I, I, I really feel strongly about the enforceability question. It's one thing to pass an ordinance. It's another thing to enforce it. Uh, clearly, we see that as people run red lights. You know, we have laws against people running red lights, but uh, they do it anyway. Um, uh, so what we have suggested here, uh, I mean, it, we just did the calculation yesterday. There are over 4,000 short-term rentals in the city of St. Louis now. And it's been noted the number is exploding. Uh, these are places where uh, we should have families living. Um, who is going to, is the, is the building commissioner really capable of chasing down 4,000 units? Um, is the revenue collector really capable of uh, making sure those folks are paying the appropriate taxes? 4,000 units. They can't do the job they've got now. Uh, and we're asking them to do this. The big issue downtown is multifamily buildings. And without any limitation on the usage of multifamily buildings for short-term rentals, and this bill provides none, um, we will be creating these ghost hotels. Uh, the police really can't enforce this stuff. Uh, yeah, we call the police all the time. Somebody fires a shot out a window. Uh, there's, a, there's a fight in the street. The police may show up half hour, an hour later. The incident is gone. Uh, there, there's no police report documenting it, and and yet we're we're the to my knowledge, an owner of a short-term rental has not been cited even once in any one of these incidents that uh, you read about in the press. This bill will do nothing to deal with any of that. Uh, frankly, it, I mean it's a framework, and I applaud the alderman for uh, acting on this. Uh, but it's right now, as far as downtown is concerned, this is a very weak bill and we need to, it, it, we need to take some time. You know, some of us have been researching the issue for three, four years now and begging for the board to pass a bill. Uh, to my knowledge, a bill has never even been introduced uh, until this year. Uh, we have some suggestions on how to, how to make it better. What's the harm in listening to those suggestions? Taking another week and listening to those suggestions, as, as Alderman Spencer said, you've had the entire summer uh, to, to talk to us, uh, and you haven't. Uh, you've only talked to yourselves in an echo chamber. So I would certainly uh, 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 support uh, giving us another week to weigh in. But what I would really support more is having a real discussion and listening to some of our suggestions. Uh, which you haven't been willing to do up to now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I do see two new people who wanted to come over uh, as panelists and speak. They haven't been sworn in. Uh, they're not in view right now. That's Dr. Carrie Wanjowski and Mr. Dan Seaman. Um, Madam Clerk, you can bring over any and everybody who indicates today would like to speak. Okay. I see one more, one more person, Susan Flower, player. That's, that's it. We can hear Dr. Dr. Wojcicki. One moment. Okay, so Susan Flayer and Dr. Carrie Winjowski, Winjows I can't see your faces. We would have to see your face to swear you in to give you a testimony. Okay, I see Dr. Carrie Winjowski and Susan Flair. Okay, could you guys please raise your right hand for me? I'm sorry, we have one more that's gonna be moved over. Marvin Nod Nadiv. Okay. 
Marvin Nadif. Okay. Okay. If you guys could raise your right hand so I can swear you in. So I will be swearing in Dr. Kerry Rangowski, Mr. Dan Seisman, Mr. Marvin Nadif, and Susan Flayer. Could you raise your right hand for me? Do you affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yes. you. We can start off with Dr. Kerry Rangowski. I hope I pronounced that correctly. I apologize. <laughs> it's okay. <clears throat> it's it's Dr. Wykowski. Um, say you're going to go skiing. You see a line of cows. They're all on skis. You might ask why cows ski. That's how you say my last name. I appreciate you all allowing public comment. Um, I would like to say that I am a little bit disappointed with the amount of uh, notice that was given for this meeting. And in that regard, I would like to see it tabled for a week and the public allowed to view the new legislation um, so that we can look at it. I, I do understand the um, need and the want to get this passed before the next um, party season as it may be, although the parties are still continuing. Um, even now, party season is not by any means over. It's really a 365 day a year type of thing. Um, <clears throat> so that's my main concern is that um, I would like to see this stay in the committee and allow the public to read the revised legislation and to review that and to discuss be for us to be able to discuss it with you. Um, I did have one, two, two big concerns. My biggest concern is the density requirement. Um, I believe if you had a density requirement that would also help with the issue of um, rentals in, in these big high rise buildings and condominiums. If there's a limit to the number of short term rentals that could be within say a 500 foot radius, that would um, prevent, you know, a hundred people from that owned in in a condo own two different condos to rent out to other people. Um, <clears throat> and I have very big concerns with that in my own neighborhood. We want to keep neighborhoods for families and not for short term rentals. Um, and we're getting to where we're we're having whole neighborhoods that are short term rentals. I did have a question. Um, unfortunately, I've been in and out of the meeting because I have to work um, and I could have taken off. This is a huge issue as far as my property values, my safety, my enjoyment of my home. And I would like to, to be aware of what's going on, uh, but I just couldn't take off with such short notice. Um, <clears throat> there's a four rental cap. That's one of the, the revisions that I heard, but then I also heard that the owner has to show that they have paid personal property tax at that location. How, and you pay your personal property tax at your primary location. So I think I'm misunderstanding that because I don't see how you can pay personal property tax at four different locations. So, um, that was my only question. If uh, somebody could address that, I would appreciate that. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Wykowski. <laughs> okay, we're gonna move on to Mr. Dan Seisman. Hello, good morning. Um, I am, I would like to, to reiterate some of the comments I heard earlier. Um, this, I live in Northampton and this is becoming a big problem in our neighborhood as well. Um, I know there's someone who lives in California who owns the property across the street from me and they 
uh, when they're not there for the three weeks a year that they come back to town, they are. Uh, it is a short-term rental, and most of it has been, you know, you know, unremarkable. But there were there are some times that the police have had to respond to large parties of the address. Um, we need to take the time to get this right for our city, get this right for our residents, get this right for the people who live in St. Louis, not for the people who live in other counties and other other states who just want to use it as a um, you know a piggy bank for themselves. We need to have a residency requirement for anyone who wants to own a short-term rental in St. Louis. We need to limit the number of short-term rentals that residents can own. And we need to invest in the um, whatever um, department in the executive of our city that will regulate uh, to ensure proper enforcement of these short-term rentals. Um, I believe that the board and most of the other folks that I've heard speak are very interested in transparency. And I, I believe that you all should let the public see and read and comment on pieces of legislation. Um, as has happened before at the Board of Aldermen, there is a substitute at the last minute and no one knows what it says and it's passed and you know, we don't even know what's going on and there it goes. So thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you. We have Ms. Susan Flayer. Hello. Um, so I have a question about um, the content of the bill in terms of if you're requiring a two night stay, does that de facto eliminate platforms that allow for hourly rentals? Um, I'm not really clear on what that does because right now I'm looking at a, uh, a, a listing on Swimply, which is something that allows you to rent your pool out. And this is a neighborhood in Botanical Heights that is renting their pool for $125 an hour. They say you can have 40 people there and they can provide a Bluetooth boom box on request. And they also say that they have uh, parking for up to 15 cars and that parking is uh, street parking. So that's, you know, one of the properties that, you know, again, I want to know if this sort of hourly rental is de facto prevented because of the two night minimum. Um, that's a specific concern to me because the Airbnb on my street has a pool and everybody who comes to it is extremely disruptive. And so that is a, a major uh, point of concern. Uh, like everybody else here, I agree with what they've said that I don't think that this should pass out of committee today, um, not showing the amended bill to the public before you do this, I don't think is appropriate. And that's it. I will give back the rest of my time. Thank you. We have Mr. Marvin Nadif. Hey, um, can you hear me? We can now. Good. Yeah. The name is Marvin Nodif. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to express my appreciation to all of the aldermen who are devoting time and best intentions to this. This is a, a complex problem, like uh, Alderman Narayan said, there's lots of moving parts. And I think we need to take our time rather than rush through a substitute that the board has not allowed any of us, the citizens advocacy group, residents in the city to, to review to offer comments. Um, Alderman Narayan was, was elaborate about saying how much robust public comments we've had. And they incorporated 40 or 33 uh, changes into the bill. That's bogus. I don't see any of the public comments, the important public comments, the substance of public comments reflected in, in what was represented about the substitute uh, this morning. The primary point is that the bill as written with a substitute will allow short-term rentals anywhere, anytime, everywhere in the city. And the residents are strongly opposed to that. I don't know how many examples we've given to the board that that is not a good public policy for the city of St. Louis to place tourists in priority over our residents. A second major point is the fiscal note on the 
on the board bill 33, which I don't think has been changed, uh, anticipates 800, 800 permits. That's what we're going to staff up for. We've already had indication that there's over 4,000 permits. Is the objective of the bill to, to cram down 4,000 permits into 800? Or how is the, the staffing going to accommodate that? Uh, and the most important point about enforceability is what they call platform accountability. I'm an attorney. I've looked at lots of other bills. Listen, Airbnb sues everybody. We need to get the public policy right and then be prepared to defend it. If they want to sue us, let them sue us. We owe Santa Monica a lot because they required uh, short-term rental platforms to provide data. That's what we're relying on, that decision. And we've got the city of Arlington to thanks to thank for going into litigation with, with the industry and being successful. We owe that to the citizens of our city to be willing to get the public policy right. And if Airbnb wants to sue, let them. We've got to defend our public policy, but get it right. Take the time to get it right. You're rushing this through. It's, it's just astonishing that the board has performed in this way. I think it's embarrassing when you're setting public policy and affecting our housing. Remember that short-term rentals convert existing housing. They're not creating new dwelling units. They're taking the best of our single family homes, our condo units, our apartment units, taking them out of the housing supply and putting them into transient lodging. Those are the public policy considerations. Thank you again. Please give this more time. It deserves more time, deserves more attention, and deserves more public input. Thank you. Thank you. And Chair Spencer, those were all of the public testimonies. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, I want to thank all the members of the public who even on short notice showed up. I mean, obviously, you know, we have a lot of folks that are very, very, very engaged and spending, as Les, as Les pointed out, a lot of years doing a lot of research. Marv, I know you've done the same, you know, just a ton of research on this. It, it, you know, as I stated before, it was not my intention to take a vote today. Um, it was my intention to put the committee sub before the public um, to possibly take a vote on that um, so that we can get it posted and the public can weigh in and, and see what's proposed. It is not, um, uh, you know, I disagree strongly that um, the issues that we're discussing are on the margins. I don't think these issues are on the margins. I think they're still critical to the construction here, whether or not we change, go forward with the zoning changes as is, or put in some restrictions and that sort of thing, or even contemplate the Kansas City model that really, really restricts non-city residents um, from having um, Airbnbs. I think that is a critical and very, very um, um, interesting piece. And then, of course, you know, seeing the New York law upheld, um, over the summer uh, provides us with some really, really important um, information about how we can, um, you know, consider doing things ourselves. So, um, you know, um, moving this out of committee means that we will not have a platform for the public to weigh in um, on the committee substitute or any specific changes that we are continuing to contemplate here. Um, it also doesn't allow us to hear directly from the building commissioner um, or other city folks, including Sarah Baker, who have been who will be in, involved in enforcement and other aspects of the bill. So moving things out of committee, I mean, I want to remind everyone we can once things get out of committee, we can push them through the full board in just, you know, two weeks time. So, um, you know, for a bill that we've been working on for four years, um, you know, and has a clause at the end that doesn't even put this into effect until technically feasible or one year from the date of this bill. And it's my understanding we've been looking at that one year. So even if we pass something today and get it through the Board of Aldermen in the next two weeks, um, it won't be it, it won't necessarily be in effect um, for next party season. We are we are really looking at a long ramp up here um, as, the, as the sponsor pointed out. So I just want to be very clear in expectations to the public what uh, it's currently written. Um, Marv, you bring up a really good point about the 800, you know, versus the 4,000 we know. Um, you know, we've got to be, we've got to be prepared to, to enforce this, um, to provide 4,000 inspections for each one of these units. I know um, the building division is short manpower right now. Um, um, we are really struggling in the eighth ward to keep up um, with things just because, you know, it's it, it, we have a hard time with, this, with the current staffing level. So, um, um, you know, 
I, I really have to also, you know, I was remiss at the beginning of the of the hearing to at least to, you know, to acknowledge the sponsor did include some of the changes that were proposed. I think we, as I pointed out, have, have some additional work to do. Um, but um, you know, the public coming out today, thank you for your for your input. Your it's, it's invaluable here. So um, with that being said, um, so Matt, can you remind us we are still on board Bill thirty three? Is that where we are? Yeah, we was just getting the public. Um testimony regarding board bill 33 and making the decision if you're going you're going to hold this in committee or not <clears throat> okay, so, so thank you madam clerk i'll take discussion on that topic okay so um Maybe I think it would be instructive to the committee to hear um, from Alderman Browning on Board Bill 34. Did Alderman Browning, did you have um, discussion on Board Bill 34 that may in inform our decision on Board Bill 33 or what, what um, or is it completely uh, separate in topic? I know these bills are interrelated and very interconnected here. Yeah, I, I think it's germane to 34 uh, having to do with the zoning. So let's put one to bed and move to the other if we could. So I think that because they're so interrelated, perhaps we can put Board Bill 33 on hold so we can just hear a discussion on Board Bill 34. I don't think it makes sense to move one without the other. So before making any movements, um, I would prefer to hear from any comments on Board Bill 34. So with that, um, I'll take a motion to put Board Bill 34 both. Put, put, Third, board Bill 33 temporarily on hold and, 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 and Board Bill 34 before us. I motion that we hold Board Bill 33 in committee at this time uh, for a meeting one week from today uh, to discuss and hear public comment and proceed with discussion on Board Bill 34. Um, before we, before we, uh, uh, consider that motion. I do want to, I did have a question to Clerk Kennedy um, regarding the public posting of Board Bill 33 uh, committee sub, if we are, if it's feasible to post that without taking a vote on, on just the committee sub. I think it's important for the public comment and that they have the actual committee sub. Um, so, Maybe rather than have hearing a motion on the, the to hear to move it entirely to next week, if we could just put it on hold right now while I'm waiting to hear back from the from the clerk and clerk Keggs, if you don't mind reaching out to clerk Kennedy, I copied on you on that as well, uh, just for clarity. I mean, I think important in hearing from the public is you know as as many members point out, they want to see the committee sub. So I'd be willing to entertain a motion to to pass that if that's the necessary step to get that in the public domain. Okay, one moment. Um, but we can, in the meantime, yeah, entertain a motion to put that on hold and keep so we can hear comments and put board for 34 before us. We can always come back. Alderman Browning, would you make that motion? I'd like it to be clear that uh, that we will get the committee sub up on the website so the public can review it. And uh, I'd still like to be able to set that date. So are we able to get confirmation that it will be available by the end of today? What I'm what I'm suggesting is while we're waiting for clarification, we simply put it on hold, not hold till next week, but rather just put it on hold so we can revisit it during this hearing after we hear your comments and while we are here and waiting to hear from Mr. Kennedy or for Kennedy on it. So if we could amend your motion to just put it on hold so we can put Board Bill 34 before us, get that public, get your comments on that so we can come back to Board Bill 33. Yes, renewing my motion to put, put uh, Board Bill 33 on hold so we can discuss Board Bill 34 at this time. Thank you. Do I have a second on the motion? I'll second it. Um, Alderman, you're please proceed. Trying to get us out of here as well. Uh, Alderman, would, would you like me to proceed on 34, you're saying? Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I should have clarified. Okay. okay. Um, so board bill 34 is a companion bill to 33. It's kind of inextricably tied to 33, uh, and only goes, uh, and 33 would only go into effect upon passage of 30. My apologies, Mr. Narayan. I don't mean to interrupt you on board bill 34. 
mm -hmm. uh, Chair Spencer, I was speaking with the clerk Kennedy. He's going to get some verification on the testimonies um, to be posted. Uh, but during that time, I needed to just be clear. There was a motion made by Alderman Browning, correct? Who seconded that to hold board bill 33? I did. I, I did. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, so board bill 34 is a companion bill that, that is completely tied into uh, 33. Uh, this uh, 34 is uh, the planning commission. Uh, th this all had to go through the planning commission prior to coming to the board. This is the board bill that the planning commission recommended regarding uh, the uh, enaction of a new chapter on the subject of short-term rentals with definitions and you know the, the a, a new zoning regulation essentially that the planning commission uh, uh, recommended. I, I will uh, note that it's it's my understanding that any changes to 34 would have to go back through the planning commission um, that that we can't um, make changes to 34 without uh, the planning commission recommending those changes uh, or else the planning commission would have to adopt those changes. I can get more clarity on that um, if there if there are changes to it. Um, but the uh, the I, I don't think it makes much sense to dive too far into 34 since 33 and since we're not voting on 33 today because we, we can't I'm not saying we can't. I, I have no desire to move on 34 uh, without movement on 33. Uh, the, the two really need to move together. Okay, thank you, Alderman Ryan. Um, uh, I, if you don't mind, would you uh, request a, an opinion from the city councilor on that? And I don't know if the city councilor has weighed in on board bill 33 as well. We talked a lot about a hypothetical litigation, but her opinion on, on the board bill as it, of the committee sub as it stands, I think would be very helpful. And uh, I know she's been very generous in providing her uh, input on other bills. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to committee for questions on board bill 34. Uh, Alderman Velasquez. I have no questions. Alderman Browning. Uh, thank you. So uh, we heard some testimony on this already and I've gotten uh, several emails and I do want people to know we are reading your emails. We just haven't had time to respond to them uh, before this meeting. Uh, the there's been a lot of concern why we are making short term rentals legal in all zoning areas of the city. Uh, they I think there's a lot of concern that currently uh, short term rentals are in violation of the current zoning laws. We just don't have enforceability there because it is frankly difficult when we don't have a permit process in place. Uh, but since 33 is creating a permit process, I'm curious why we are proceeding uh, with Board Bill 34 and making short-term rentals uh, legal in all zoning of the city. Uh, if you could address that a little bit. Sorry, I had an issue unmuting myself there. So uh, this uh, this board bill is what the planning commission recommended. This is not a board bill that I, um, this wasn't my idea. <laughs> this is the planning commission's recommendation on how we uh, move to, uh, to regulate essentially short-term rentals. We knew that there needed to be uh, some updates to zoning. Uh, the planning commission looks at all matters zoning uh, and this is their recommendation on that. So uh, Board Bill 34 is, is fairly deferential to the Planning Commission, uh, knowing that um, this had to come through the Planning Commission before it could go to the board. 
Okay, thank you. Um, perhaps we can get someone from the Planning Commission who might be able to speak to that uh, in further detail for next week's meeting. Uh, I think that we do owe it to the public, just the number of questions we've gotten about this to explain why we are taking this approach. Uh, I imagine there's probably something to do with city code and, and some legalities with it, but I do want to kind of get some clarification on that uh, as we move forward, just to answer that question that's been asked of us many times. Sure. And that's the uh, summation of my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Browning. Um, I think it might be really helpful. I mean, I want to put a hard stop on this so that we can move this forward and not hold this up any longer than we need to. Um, you know, if considering that we're going to have another hearing next week um, on both of these bills, I want to just, um, you know, uh, Alderman Ryan, I will give you my full list of things I put together over the last 48 hours um, on, on, on some changes I think that would be very helpful to the bill, as well as some comparisons to Kansas City. If we have other speakers that we'd like to come, um, and I think it's important that um, we consider getting the committee sub before the, the public as well, so that we can just take one more round of public comment and, and then um, and then try to make sure that we we, we, we have a, uh, a bill that we can all kind of buy into. I'd also respectfully ask that the folks that came before us that mentioned they'd like to that they've done research that we meet with them in the next week um, and at least you know hear what they have to say in a, in a, in a constructive manner. Um, you know, so that we can maybe consider some some of the changes that they have done so much research doing. I mean, it's it's incredible to have lawyers um, who are volunteering their time um, to help us make um, um, make our laws better. I know I don't have um, an infinite amount of time to, to read every single bill across the, the, the world. And, you know, it was just over the last 48 hours kind of digging through the Kansas City bills and, and some of the other things that have been going on in the, in the New York stuff. And it's very, very hard for, for us to do as a small body. So leaning into those would be very, very helpful. So I'm going to respectfully ask that this, this committee, if there's individuals in particular, including the Planning Commission or other folks that you want to have present, they don't want to have anything left on the table for next hearing that it will push us back even further. Um, so getting back with the sponsor, myself, and, and the clerk to make sure we have all those ducks in a row. Um, and anybody um, in the hearing at the very beginning, so we're not moving folks over so we can move this expeditiously through it, would be very, very helpful. So having that, um, having, having that, uh, having that uh, advanced, advanced notification would be helpful. Um, and then um, I think with that, what I'd like to do, um, if it's okay with the sponsors, move back to 33 and then uh, take a vote on the committee stuff so that we can properly post it or unless we've heard otherwise from the clerk, I haven't gotten any, any response to that. Madam Clerk, did you have um, any comments on how we can make sure that we put the committees up before the public? The clerk is on now. He's going to go ahead and address that for you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Clerk, would you mind um, addressing the question about how we can make sure that the public has access um, and is posting on the committee stuff? Yeah, th thank you. It is possible to put it on the website. The, the only problem is that every action related to a bill is tied to an activity. For example, when a bill is posted onto the website, what is it? So one of the possibilities is that it's being first read or that it is being reconsidered or that it has been substituted or that it has been amended. And each one of those act activities are tied to the different postings of the bill. So we'd have to figure out there's no posting or no activity on the website as it is designed that says a committee substitute has been introduced, but not passed. There's no way to clearly show that on the website. So we have to be creative. We can get it on there, but it'll have to be creatively placed on there, how it will show up in the posting. So I'm thinking right now, we'll just have to say it's like first read, that's the first time it was introduced, but some activity has to be tied to it as the website is designed for it to be able to show up on the site. I just wanted to explain that. So if you see it in that way, and it may seem a little strange, it's because of how the site is presently designed. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sponsor, the, uh, uh, Mr. Alderman Ryan, would you be uh, amenable to having it uh, listed on the city website as, as introduced in committee or as considered or some other way so that we can publicly post it? Sure, sure. I mean, wh wh whatever's gonna work as long as it's not 
misleading <laughs> um, uh -huh, uh -huh, than right, that right. What, whatever's going to work. I, I know that sometimes yeah. we have to get clever with uh, with tech solutions. Right. Hopefully be clever. <laughs> that we can claim it's that. <laughs> but the idea is that we can get it on there just figuring out under which activity will that have to be placed. That's all. Mm -hmm. That's all I had. I just wanted it to be clear so when you see it, you won't think it's just strange. It's just how it's structured. Sure, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. So um, uh, we will get that posted and we are uh, yeah. respectfully requested all members of the committee if they have any additional thoughts for Alderman, the sponsor of the bill, Alderman Ryan, we'll get those to you um, in the next 24, 48 hours so that we have due time um, and that um, we consider meeting with the, with the members of the public that have identified themselves as, you know, and, and, and consider, consider the changes that they've, um, they've outlined. Um, and with that, um, do we have any further discussion on Bill 33 or 34? Um, I would just like to get commitment that we are scheduling a meeting for one week from today, uh, and that we plan to take a vote at that meeting one week from today. Thank you, Alderman Browning. Um, I am committed to having a meeting at the regularly scheduled transportation and commerce, transportation and commerce committee, uh, hearing time 9 a.m. on Tuesday for the following Tuesday, um, the only thing that would bar that is an unavailability in some way from the staff, um, if that's okay with the sponsor and, and everybody else. And we, and we works for me. That works for me. Okay, and just to be clear with everybody, so we all know what to expect, we do plan on taking a vote after hearing uh, additional public comment at that time. I think we'll have, we we would entertain motions, but I, I think to prescribe votes is kind of a difficult thing to do. But certainly, I think we should be um, open to, to considering a motion to take a vote on that at that time. That's fair. Yes, Alderman, Alderman Woman Velasquez, my husband. I mean, I think we're asking in good faith that that I mean, I know there's been a little bit of confusion about the actual rules and and whatnot as far as if the chair can entertain the motion. But I think what I don't want to interpret Alderman Browning is asking. What I'm I think what I'm asking is that we in good faith ask that if we have robust, if we have a moment for public commentary, if we're pausing voting on this today, that you as chair will entertain a motion next yep. week to vote on it. Alderman Velasquez, Alderman Velasquez, that's what I just indicated. Yes, I mean, I think to promise a vote, we should make sure that we all feel confident in that. But yes, um, I, you know, so and, and a motion will be entertained. Well, Thank you. Yes. Okay, with that, uh, do we have any uh, any other items on our agenda? Um, I need to be clear. Are we taking a motion to hold board bill 34 in committee? I mean, I don't know that we necessarily need to hold any of these things. I don't want to put any labels on them. I think they're just remaining committee. We had some discussion today and we plan to hear them next week and consider voting them out of committee at that time. All right. Um, with that, uh, we have no resolutions for, so that consensus of, of line item four, we have uh, no resolutions for review, committee discussions. Um, was, it, is, was there any written testimony we should acknowledge, Madam Clerk? No, I have not. There was none. Okay. I'm, I'm unaware if there are any excused ad, ad, aldermen, but I, I think everyone was here with the exception of older woman, Tyus, who I believe was removed from the committee. Yes, correct. And with that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Hearing no objections, but uh, we are we are adjourned. Thank you. We'll see you next week at the same time. <laughs>